Welcome to episode 154 of the Grip Strip Podcast, the Watches, Medals, and Champs edition of the Grip Strip Podcast. I'm your host, Philip Matthew, and I'm here with my co host. We got to go back to it. Um, it's bad juju, I think. We weren't, we didn't do it last week. That might have been part of it. Um, got to go find it here. Part of what makes the GSP the GSP. Uh, pin, yeah, here we go. Yeah, he's a computer genius, an iRacing Indy 500 champion, a gentleman and a scholar. He also attended the Rolex 24 this weekend and is part of the crew that's trying to get me through the fact that the 49ers lost their quarterback and then lost the plot yesterday. His name is Josh Fine. What's going on, brother? I'm doing great, Phil. Uh, yeah, sorry to hear about the 49ers. I mean, I was watching that game and, um, you know, they didn't really have a chance uh, after Brock Purdy got hurt, but... Uh, you know, at least, you know, you guys were able to get to the championship game like that, but, you know, unfortunately you have to lose like that uh, again this year, but, you know, it happens and hopefully you get back next year. But for me, you know, good weekend again, uh, going to the Rolex 24 uh, again this year, went last year, now attended second time, but had a great time there. And, you know, you said I'm any I racing Indy 500 champion, and well, uh, I was within feet of uh, Elio Castroneves pre-race. Uh, I managed to make it right up to the 60 car as uh, you know he was talking on his pre-race interview, and on on the you know on the radio, and I was trying to trying to get a picture with him, but uh, he just walked away uh, right before uh, I could get up to him. So I was within feet of an actual Indy 500 champion, and you know could have been a powerful uh, combo right there, Indy 500 champion and the iRacing Indy 500 winners. So, um, you know, a, a great, great weekend overall at the Rolex and, um, you know, on the football side, eh, kind of, kind of, eh, you know, with uh, the way the 49ers turn out and the Bengals. So, um, you know, best of both, or, you know, you have, you have both sides of the street there. So i uh, ready to talk about it though. Yeah, we both, uh, I think we picked what, the majority would have wanted to see, but the NFL wanted the um, Kelsey Bowl slash Kermit the Frog to get his coronation, which um, in two weeks he'll get the MVP at honors. And then a couple of days, two, three days later, he'll have a chance to win his second Super Bowl of his career after it would be his third Super Bowl in four years. It's his third Super Bowl in four years. Um, in theory, he has had a chance. He's been in the AFC Championship game every year of his career. He's this is five years. I this is his fifth year in the league. He's made three Super Bowls. The other two years, he went to the AFC Championship game and lost. So it's a pretty um, crazy start to a career for uh, Patrick Mahomes, and uh, he'll get a second MVP, and uh, we'll see what he can do. Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, were able to go and uh, take advantage of the Niners there and uh, put them out of their misery early. Put me out of my misery. I, I mean, even though I did have to spend way more money at the V than I should have, uh, I was able to leave there basically uh, around right around halftime or a little after halftime because I'd already given up. I'll say, oh, you're not a real fan. I'm like, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm intelligent. I'm realistic. We're down 21 to 7. Because we had a dishwasher at quarterback, and he couldn't handle a fucking snap. All right, I'm getting into my tangent. I'm, we have to get into the preview. We're gonna go through all the football discussion of that of the Kelsey Bowl, um, coaching GM news. Um, if we, if it matters, I don't think it really does. I think I'm I'm gonna take a couple weeks off, two three. I'm weeks off from football at this point. I think there's only two, three, there's only two weeks left of football. I think I can avoid it. Uh, Josh went to the Rolex. It was a great race. The uh, Meyer Shank Racing Acura team gets the victory, two consecutive victories in, in the Rolex 24. Honda and Acura have had uh, an amazing, uh, amazing run at the Rolex in recent recent years so it's nice to see that if you are an Acura fan or Honda fan um the Cadillacs the Ganassi Cadillacs were strong so we'll get into all that and all the all the other uh winners that 
uh, all five classes and the winners. I mean, more like four classes because the LMP3 category was a waste of time. Um, GTP reliability was a big deal during the Rolex. We'll get into that as well. There is NASCAR news. Uh, all three major series. Uh, we're going to get into the one piece uh, later on. But uh, and because we're getting close to Daytona a few weeks away, of course, for NASCAR. The roundup is very short and sweet. The race of champions, which took place in Sweden, uh, got to catch a little bit of the actual race of champions itself, the driver head-to-head -head battle amongst all the drivers, uh, the team event I missed on Saturday, and then Saudi Epre doubleheader uh, in Doria, for Formula E, we will make the we will preview the Bushlight Clash at the Coliseum, and make some picks. Maybe bring out the algorithm out of uh, the dust, and uh, since we need it for Daytona, so maybe we'll see if there's a way to uh, figure out how to eliminate nine people from the field scientifically. Um, just an idea, just a thought for later on. Uh, and uh, yeah, Josh will do his sim segment. Tell us all things going on in the world of iRacing in the gaming world and uh, we'll close the deal so yeah we'll first uh, start NFL the Lamar Hunt trophy stays in the house that Lamar Hunt built uh, and now it's Kermit the Frogs factory and uh, Patrick Mahomes wins and gets to his third Super Bowl in the last four years uh, Cincinnati was getting a little too cocky in some ways, but I also think Cincinnati was in that game. There's really, really only been Cincinnati in recent years that has given uh, Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs problems. Uh, but what ended up happening was the jig was up with their offensive line, and there's an irony to that that both teams I lost yesterday had serious offensive line issues. Um, of course, Burrow's offensive line has basically been terrible for the majority of his career, and um, he gets hit more than it, it's got a it's got a read of Andrew Luck. He had a read of where he had a John Elway, Jim Kelly arc going, and it's entirely possible he could have that kind of arc still. But what the arc he has now is he has the Andrew Luck arc, but he's actually gone to a Super Bowl because he just gets. He just gets murdered way too much because his offensive line sucks. And Cincinnati's cheap. And he's up for an extension. So, you, I mean, if he had made the Super Bowl, I'm sure it would have cost them maybe a couple more million a year. But they miss out on that deal. Uh, Patrick Mahomes was not amazing. But in the end, he did Patrick Mahomes things. And he was able to go and... Um, uh, go and uh, uh, get in there, do what he had to do to win. And um, I didn't need to see that just there. So um, so that's what it is. I mean, I basically wasn't really, I, after the first game, I, I don't think I was really all that uh, invested. But I did catch the end of the game, and I think probably I should have just left it alone because it was they'd got back into the game uh, the Bengals, they were behind early and then it got away or then they got back into it. They're down 13 to six at half. It was 20 to 13 at after three quarters. And then the Bengals were able to score. I mean, yeah, you had brother Knight Harrison Butker gets that field goal. That's the only points of the first quarter. And then in the second quarter, Harrison Butker gets another field goal, uh, chip shot, Evan McPherson to make it 6-3, and then Patrick Mahomes, of course, throws to Travis Kelsey. Uh, picked by, uh, by uh, what do you call, Joe Burrow, but they were able to force a three and out. Then they get a field goal to make it 13-6. Uh, to six. In the second half, Burrow gets that touchdown to T. Higgins, but... Mahomes responds to MVS and uh, puts themselves back up 20 to, what is it, 20 to um, 13 there. Um, 
Yeah, it was thirteen six, then it was thirteen thirteen actually then. Yeah. So twenty to thirteen. And then uh Kansas City and Mahomes after a punt, Mahomes fumbles. Uh what do you call Burrow goes and hands off to P Ryan for a touchdown. The punt, the interception that uh that one of the turnovers that that second turnover was a backbreaker really, but goes and they had to punt again after that, and that basically was some bad penalties, terrible officiating, which isn't shocking. Um, that was across the board yesterday too. Um, the aside penalty aside, no pun intended. Um. I mean, yeah, that's going to get called 10 times out of 10, and especially against Kermit the Frog. Um, but that game was not officiated well. The game before wasn't officiated well, and people don't really are not going to really think about it because the game got out of hand early, Josh. But um, in this case, at the end of the day, Kansas City did what they had to do. Joe Burrow probably didn't have the best game that he needed to have, and... Um, you can't make the kind of you can't turn the ball over twice, and uh, and not really. And Jamar Chase was I mean he had seventy five yards on six receptions, but on eight targets. But Higgins was the guy yesterday. They lost Tyler Boyd early in the game, and I think that played a a role. They weren't really using Hayden Hurst as much as they probably could have. Uh, the running game was non existent. Uh, Both sides really. Yeah, I mean, but Kansas City isn't really known, to be honest, they're not known for um, their run as much as they want to talk about their two-headed monster at running back. They're not known for running the damn ball. Um, I mean, there's, it. you know, I mean, I just looked through the Hubbard and Hendrickson were quiet, and the interior line had their issues. Asai actually had a great game. Everyone's going to say the late hit, the late hit, but he made a pick. Five total tackles, uh, three total like three tackles and two assists, and a pick, and a pass deflection, or no, he had a pass deflection. So I mean, he was he was in this game. He showed up to play. It's very emotional at the end. Uh, it's unfortunate. Um, you can't blame him. They'll blame him, but really, it wasn't him. In the grand scheme of things, Burrow threw for two seventy and one touchdown. But he turned the ball over twice. You turn the ball over against a team like the Chiefs. You're you're not really gonna you're not gonna win. Uh, both both Kelsey and Mahomes fumbled yesterday, but Mahomes fumbled it and lost it. And so I mean, there was a fifth down. It became a fifth oh, yeah, down because stupid. of the officials, which was bad. Um, there's other stuff, but yeah, I mean, at the end of the day. Kansas City won, and they're going to the Super Bowl. Uh, That's what the NFL did want. So another Super Bowl for Patrick Mahomes there, Josh. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I hate to see it really. Um, You know, especially after the previous week, you know, Jacksonville losing to Kansas City. I was really wanting to see them lose after that and want them to, you know, go go to the Super Bowl. Uh, But Kansas City, you know, ekes out a win once again. Mahomes, you know, wasn't that great in that game, to be honest. Um, you know, he obviously is hampered by the injury and everything. Uh, but Kansas City uh, and Cincinnati, you know, their offensive lines both didn't really do that great of a job. And, I mean, both of them were really under duress throughout different parts of the game. And, you know, for Burrow, I mean, he, he got pretty good in the second half and, you know, led them tied the game and everything the touchdown to T Higgins uh, in the third quarter that was a pretty good score there um you know and then they were able to tie it at 20 and they had a chance you know with um you know the minute left they could have driven down the field and um I didn't really like some of the play calls that they had at the end you know they had two deep shots um you know on, on there and the second deep shot was the one that got picked and uh yeah I don't really like you know when he goes to the same the same uh, route you know, the same time and or two two plays in a row and um, you know, it makes it really predictable there and you know, you could probably could have gone to a different you know, different kind type of uh 
play there with the second one and avoided the pick. But the pick happened, and then defensively, uh, they gave it up with the penalty there. But then also on special teams on the punt, uh, there was a hold around the 45-yard line or a block in the back, actually, uh, by one of the chief players on, on the Bengals, and that was not called. Uh, the refs missed that one, of course. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, the refs wanted to be able to get the Chiefs into the Super Bowl, I guess. Um, people will talk about, oh, the NFL is rigged, and it seems like, you know, in recent weeks, you know, with the NFL, there's been a lot of NFL is rigged uh, topics on Twitter. It's been trending for a bit. And, by the way, NFL and most sports entities are uh, legally classified as uh, sports entertainment. So uh, there might might be some truth to that if it is rigged or not, but uh, maybe not like the outright like the WWE, but something, you know, where there's some level of manipulation there. But uh, that's beside the point, though. But, you know, in this game, uh, Kansas City, they just did enough uh, as, you know, as a team to be able to go out and win the game and go to the Super Bowl, uh, unfortunately. And uh, they're back and, you know, they go against the Eagles, Andy Reid's former team. Obviously, we already talked about that game with the San Francisco and uh, Philadelphia, but uh, it's going to be interesting to see how uh, Jalen Hurts and Patrick Mahomes go up against each other. Um, you know, you have two different styles of offense on both sides, and it should be an interesting game. And you, um, you, know, you have the Philadelphia Eagles defense, which I mean, they've been pretty good throughout the year as well. So uh, we'll see if how well they can hold up against uh, Patrick Mahomes and if you know, they can put him into situations just like how we saw against uh, Cincinnati uh, this past game and how they were able to affect him uh, with some of his uh, plays there. So we'll have to see how it is in the Super Bowl. And, you know, one interesting fact is that, you know, this Super Bowl is basically going to be the uh, Super Bowl of Jacksonville quarterback pass because uh, Gardner Minshew is the backup quarterback for the Eagles. Obviously, Jaguars starter, and by the way, his first ever NFL appearance was against the uh, season opener against the Chiefs back in 2019, uh, and he had a you know magnificent magnificent debut uh, in that game. Uh, and now he's going to be in the Super Bowl. I don't know if he'll play or not, but he'll be in the Super Bowl against the Chiefs. So, uh, kind of goes back full circle and everything there for Minshew uh, and the legend of his uh, you know mustache and all that stuff. So. Uh, there's that. And then, of course, on the other end, you have Chad Henney, the backup quarterback and starter uh, in Jacksonville from 2012 through 2017. So there's that factor, too. So, you know, it's uh, very interesting storylines there, too. So um, I guess I'm going to pull for the Eagles. You know, just tired of the uh, Chiefs winning and everything. And um, yeah, of course, the Eagles fans are obnoxious. They're a bunch of jabronis and all that stuff. Uh, I mean, they might be the jabroniest of the jabronis. I don't know, but uh, they certainly are wacky and everything. But um, I guess I'll pull for the Minshew factor. I've still got my Minshew t-shirt uh, from uh, the DTWD Originals guys in, in my closet. So I'll wear that one on Super Bowl Sunday and pull for that. So uh, I reluctantly will be doing that. But, uh, I mean... Chiefs Eagles, uh, probably the least exciting matchup out of all of them, just because I think both teams you didn't want to see them make it to the Super Bowl. Um, rather, rather would have seen the Cincinnati Bengals and the 49ers, but it is what it is at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, you can't take it away from Kermit the Frog. They get to, they somehow or another are able to get the number one seed every year. That home field advantage does make a difference. Uh, you get an advantageous divisional matchup after you go and get a week off. Then you're basically really playing for the championship game. And they've been able to hold off uh, the like to be held off Cincinnati in this spot. Um, last year they didn't. Uh, they were able to, they lost to uh, Brady, of course, that first year. And I'm trying to remember who they beat. The other two years, uh, I'm forgetting off the top, but really it doesn't matter. Um, so, I mean, they've been at home. He's made the championship every year of his career and all that. So, I guess he's pretty good. Uh, we'll have to deal with two weeks of his stupid wife and doofus of a brother on social media. 
and then his dad yeah. going and riding the coattails of his son. Um, that'll always that'll all be be great too. Um, so that'll be insufferable uh, on top with the of the the obnoxiousness and stupidity of Philly fans. Um, which the irony is, I've never and I'm, I'm, I guess that's a we'll get into it that way uh, with a segue in terms of the Philadelphia Eagles franchise. I don't really have any issues with them. There's plenty of people who hate them, of course, in this area because of the Giants fandom or being a Cowgirls fan or general Redskin commander fan or some shit. Um, I don't hate them. They were part of one of the greatest days of my life because I was able to watch them beat Tom Brady in the Super Bowl and watch a Philadelphia Eagles fan puke, pass out, come to, to actually see the Eagles win, see Big Dick Nick, get his, really earn his nickname, get his statue and all that crap, a uh, statue left, the whole, all those things. Uh, Doug Peterson getting that Super Bowl for Philadelphia, first championships in, for the, in football since 1960. So that was 40, that was like 57 years. So that's, that was a big deal. Uh, Nick Sirianni, on the other hand, is a weirdo. Uh, I, he might be an idiot savant, I guess. He's a really good football guy. I mean, heck, he had his kids on the on the ta- in the desk for on the days for his press conference, and his daughter was going and going off and doing like Rebecca Larue stuff, and then he had to tell her to stop, and then she st- kept on going, and then the other two kids started going and doing gimmicks. So you gotta love kids uh, in that sense, but I guess the weirdness is a family trait. Um, anytime he talks, it just seems like it's convoluted he's like the benji bronc of nfl coaches but the son of a bitch is going to the super bowl so um i hope ty schmidt gets himself ready because he's gonna be busy for the next two weeks doing his uh um impression of nick sirianni for sure the eagles team you got to give them credit they came determined they were ready their fan base was ready to do whatever they were going to do to any fan that decided to, that was idiotic enough to wear 49ers gear there. Um, it's not, it's not great. Honestly, it fits the narrative, but, um, from what I read on some people on the socials for 49ers, uh, fans and they wasn't great. I'm like, well, on the one hand, I'm like, well, I'm not surprised based on just history and in general, but then also no shit, Sherlock, you're really playing with fire here. Uh, you're playing with a general fan base that is willing to yell, yell at women at wing bowl to show their tits. You're yelling, you're talking about people who boo Santa Claus, people who go and they have a court and jail in the freaking stadium, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that's what we're dealing with. I mean, we do deal with NASCAR here, on this show, and that's the lowest common denominator, I think, in terms of sports in general. Um, Philly fans are in that mix for lowest common denominator, um, mainly because I guess they like to consume a lot of alcohol and get really stupid. Uh, But a lot of them seem to hold jobs, so there it is. Um, Probably, well, I'm not going to go there, because I would bring up another thing that's really fucked up that happened this last few days. but. Long story short, the Eagles were the better team. Um, they didn't really have to play yesterday, to be honest. I think they really played about a quarter, and um, that's it. They really didn't have to do much. Once uh, Hassan Reddick got turnstiled by Mike McGlinchey and Tyler Croft, who proved once again why he's a backup tight end, uh, those and why Mike McGlinchey shouldn't have a job blocking anything. Uh, that son of a bitch all year. You, you just go back all year. They ran that play to Trey week two, the stupid, whatever that stupid gun run crap that Shanahan wanted to do. And he ran to the right side and got rolled up, up under Mike McGlinchey. 
the Jimmy Garoppolo play, there is one aspect that he should have just given up and died on it, which I don't understand. I, it's like the one thing I don't get is Peyton Manning and Eli Manning knew how to dive and just get the hell out of the way. Even Brett Favor, when he gave up the sack to Michael Strahan, that that inbred retard. Um, like, no, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. That inbred dipshit um, who goes and sends his junk out to everybody and then does illegal stuff with money from, well, it is Mississippi. I mean, it's, to be fair, it doesn't really matter. It's Mississippi. Um, but he goes and takes a dive. How come most of these quarterbacks don't know? Like, when you know you're getting sacked, just get the hell out of the way. Set, just fall. It's over. You're trying to keep it alive like you're Superman or your spider pig. It's over, man. Like, but not Jimmy Garoppolo. He's trying to impress all the women that he has all the Facebook page, all these people that are obsessed with him on 49ers. And there's women that cover that cover sports that bet on that work at betting shows that are marks for Jimmy Garoppolo. That's okay. Jimmy, yeah. Jimmy pulls the ladies. He can't, he's got a, he's got a pool. <laughs> he can't throw a ball 15 yards uh, accurately. So it's like past 15 yards accurately. So what the hell does it matter when you're a quarterback? Oh, he smiles. He has a great smile. Then put him on the goddamn bachelor. He's, he's a free agent. Go and call whoever the hell the idiot is. Another a non non uh, starter, Jesse Palmer, and say, "Hey, I want to be on the Bachelor. Be on the Bachelor, bro. They, they go on one of those stupid dating shows. Go and do the stupid Travis Kelsey gimmick that he did and failed at. Don't act like you're a quarterback. But the fact is, he went and was running around like a dope against, I think it was Miami or whoever it was, and then got rolled up, and then he he got injured, and that was the end of him." And then uh, we had uh, BDB in uh, Brock Purdy, Mr. Irrelevant, that became Mr. Relevant. And from then on, at least until yesterday, was one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. And uh, the offense looked totally different. In a lot of ways, it reminded me of the 2016 Atlanta Falcons offense, uh, the way it was run, the execution, going to Brandon Ayuk, going and getting those deep passes and going and also utilizing everybody on the field, getting George Kittle back in the game, getting Debo to do go and play the two-way game that he's able to play along with Christian McCaffrey. Offense in Kyle Shanahan's entire existence as a head coach of the 49ers has never looked better. Defense is the best defense in the NFL. And the reality of the world is they only gave up, I think, 200-something yards of offense yesterday in a game where they didn't even have a quarter. They ended up not having a quarterback. They only gave up a couple hundred yards of offense, and you're, you're – but what ends up happening, uh, Hassan Reddick gets turnstiled uh, by McGlinchey and Croft. He runs and nails – Brock Purdy in the arm. Uh, he has a UCL tear. He tried to throw. It wasn't really pretty. And um, in the grand scheme of things, he threw for like 24 yards. But considering Josh Johnson couldn't, I mean, I, I wouldn't trust. Oh, God. That SOB, he came in the game and he looked like a, a complete waste of time. They could have called any Tom, Dick, or Jane from the stands, and they would have been more prepared than Josh Johnson seemed to be. Guy's been in the league 15 years. You're just going to be that much deer in the headlights? Like, I get they're a tough pass rush. I get it. Like, the reality is the offensive line, that's the worst this offensive line has played all year. Or, you know what? I, I'll, I'll, I'll take that back. The last time their offensive line played this bad was the last time they lost. The last time the Niners lost until yesterday was against Kermit the Frog and the Kansas City Chiefs. So maybe there's something to be said about that. The two last two teams they lost to are the two teams that are in the Super Bowl. And before that, you can't really say that any outside of the Atlanta game where they were just smoked. Um, and that was like Marcus Mariota going back to Oregon Heisman Trophy days where they were really, like, it wasn't 
like they should have won that game or they were in the game, but they lost like the Chicago game, which was horrible with Trey. And then that Denver debacle on Sunday night football um, where Jimmy Garoppolo ran out of the end zone. And that essentially was the difference. Um, And so Brock gets hurt. Josh Johnson comes in, looks clueless. CMC does his thing to go and get the one touchdown. It was a 7-7 game. And, um, you know, and they, they had, the. I mean, the Niners were able to force a, force a three and out after the Purdy fumble then, but the Niners then had a punt. So in the end, the first quarter was only 7-7. There wasn't a whole lot going on. Eagles fans want to go and say they dominated. The scoreboard says they did. The reality of the world is, wasn't that amazing? Okay, I had a pretty hard time uh, doing their main part of their game, which is passing and having that whole dynamic with Jalen Hurts, A.J. Brown. I mean, Devontae Smith, I mean, that's bullshit too, that they called. They, they were short. Then they went for it on fourth down. They throw the ball. He drops the ball. They don't. There's nobody in 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 corporate in New York City. There's there's not a re- replay official anywhere in that goddamn stadium throwing a throwing the freaking button to say we need to review this. That's convenient. Um, the way the Eagles were basically just were like going it on every play and just almost like going and jumping on people like it's WWE, that seemed uh, a bit interesting too, and they didn't bother to call it. Uh, but uh, what the, I forget what that idiot's name is. There was a, a refereeing, but... Oh, Hussey, yeah. Hussey's like middle of the road. Um, so I'm not surprised, but they say these are all-star crews. How can you have all-star crews when the majority of them couldn't wipe their own ass? How can they be all-stars? What's yeah. all-stars at? Shitting themselves? That's what they're all-stars at. The all-star Most crews, all-star. they're bad. Yeah, they're bad. The, every time they have an all-star crew, guarantee it's going to be a badly called game. Just go, like, I don't understand what the point of it is. Go and give them a bonus. The best or what you grade them out to be, give them a bonus. Let them have their teams... The lead official have their teams go and call these games. You pick and choose however. And then after the playoff, all the playoff games are done. You reassess along with the regular season and pick whoever was that best crew and send them to the Super Bowl. Simple. Makes too much sense. That's why nobody will do it. So they give up. So in the second quarter, McCaffrey gets that huge... Touchdown to make it 7 7. Um, then there was the, uh, the, the Eagles were able to drive 67 yards on 20 plays and uh, get that touchdown 14 7. No problem. Basically, you know, right at that point, they're, you know, they had a minute, it was like a minute and a half left. You basically try to run this clock out. Go to halftime down 14-7. Still a game. Josh Johnson shouldn't be allowed to be anywhere near football. He shouldn't have hands to hold a football. I'm going into the whole um, uh, freaking uh, uh, Jay Farrell, Stephen A. Smith thing about about Chris Bosh. That's I'm not going to do it because it's better. He does the job and he, it's hilarious. Watch that on YouTube. You go and watch him. Whatever he said about Chris Bosch is what fits Josh Johnson. He is god awful. I hope this is the end of him ever being in an NFL game. Uh, this is the last time you ever see him in the NFL. He he has got a great career playing in the USFL or the XFL. Might set the world on fire. Go to the Arena League. Whatever. Just never grace come up on a football field. And especially on any football field in Niners uniform ever again. Get the hell out of here. His play was abominable. Not even be able to hold a catch a snap. It's like, oh, you're being hard on him. The guy's just coming to the game, whatever. I'm like, 
For fuck's sake, you've played quarterback for 25 years. You played in the NFL for 15 years. You know how to catch a goddamn ball? Like, really? And that literally was it. When he fumbled that ball and they got that in the red zone and they scored that touchdown, I knew the game was over. At least at 14-7, to there was a sliver of hope. There was a sliver. Because the Eagles weren't doing jack crap, really. They got two turnovers. They killed a quarterback, which was basically where they won the game anyway. It was 14-7. They had one decent drive. And they got, bo- there was a bogus call in early in the game. They went, it says 13 for 66 yards, but the point is they missed a couple of calls on that drive. So you'll say, okay, they had two really great drives and they ran the ball well. Well, that's what it is. D'Amico Lines is one foot out the door because he's about to be the Houston Texans coach. So he wasn't focused on a game plan. And it's obvious because they had nothing. They had no answer for the Eagles run game. Like the Eagles run game is so amazing. They made Kenneth Gainwell look like freaking, um, what's his name? Brian Westbrook yesterday. They made Miles Sanders look like he was Charlie Garner or some shit or insert Eagle running back of the past. I mean, it's just ridiculous. I mean, you you can got one of them drunk drunk jackasses out of the stands, and he could have went out there and ran on the Niners defense. Nick Bosa, who may and may get the defensive player of the year, more than likely will, but we'll see, was non-existent this whole playoff. And he's your best defensive player. That's a problem. I mean, Fred Warner, uh, Dre Greenlaw definitely showed up. But I'm not so sure about yesterday. I have to go through the stats, actually, of this game. I mean, uh, stats, yeah. And as a team, the Eagles only had 269 total yards. They want to crow about having 269 total yards. They basically didn't have, they had the same average yards per play. They had the 148 rushing, which I think that's the one big piece if we're really going to get into it it's that and the the penalty oh there you go san francisco had 11 penalties they started the game early hussey was calling penalties on the eagles and then after that i think every penalty they called was on san francisco the rest of the game convenient but the eagles were able to run the ball they were not efficient on third down they were able to, they killed Bert Purdy, and that's what had happened. The Niners gave them the game, uh, really. I mean, two fumbles that led to touch. Uh, two fumbles, one of them led to a touchdown. And then there was, they had, uh, how the hell did, oh, they punted to the nine, and then they had a long drive. They had the turnover on downs, a field goal, another fumble. It uh, didn't matter at that point. They had three fumbles. They only converted one into a score. And But it just gets back to the point. Murdering Purdy was the difference, really. The offensive line, um, I was having a conversation with a couple of people, but then also Cam Inman of San Jose Mercury News went and said, like the one takeaway he had from the game is like they didn't have any understanding of how to go and block a a great pass rush. And this is after they played Micah Parsons last week. But to be fair, you look at the two other guys that are in that defensive player of the year deal. Chris Jones had a great game against the 49ers weeks ago, the last time they had lost. Parsons was in the game. They were able to kind of manage him but he had a presence in the grand scheme of things between Rid- Reddick and Cox and this guy, that guy, whatever, nothing. McCaffrey tried. They didn't have a backup running back because Elijah Mitchell gets hurt again, of course. And that was a problem. They didn't have a third quarterback because Jimmy Garoppolo was ruled out. So that was a problem. Um, they just didn't have it yesterday. And I'm angry that, you know, you get this far 
two years in a row. And it's like a play here or there that basically determined, I mean, Jimmy Ward proving once again, why he's a safety. Cause he can't catch. I dropped a, a, a pick six uh, from Jalen hurts. And last year he dropped the ball that would have locked the game up for the Niners to get him to the Super Bowl. Now he's a free agent. He can go. Um, Mike McGlinchey is a free agent. He can jump off the freaking Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, literally one of the worst offensive. Like, it's funny that the Philadelphia Eagles probably have the best right tackle in the NFL, and the Niners have one of the worst. And they use the uh, number one draft pick on them, use a top 10 draft pick on them. It fulfills, it kind of feeds into my hatred of Notre Dame. Um, football, and then because usually whenever the Niners have Notre Dame players, they suck, and he's yet another example of it. Though he'll probably get paid like $20 million by somebody, but he can go and play in like Indianapolis or wherever the hell, play in some irrelevant place, um, the Raiders or or something like that. Solomon Thomas went there and is irrelevant there too, but go there, or might go to Houston, something like that. He can go to. Eagles uh, had plenty going for them. They knocked out Purdy, the run game. Uh, they had no game plan for the run game. They had no game plan for the um, pass rush. That's it. Um, I went off pretty good there. Josh, um, I don't know if you have anything to add on that game. Yeah, so for the 49ers game, I mean, you already talked a, a lot about it with uh, the Eagles and um, how they were able to dominate the 49ers and how the 49ers made a lot of mistakes and a lot of errors, especially by the right tackle. But, I mean, for me, like, you know, as soon as Brock Purdy got hurt, you know, I, I knew it was over right there. And, um, I mean, well, not immediately, but, like, when he said he couldn't go and he couldn't have any feeling in his uh, – you know, in his right hand or anything like that, um, and had a hard time handling the ball uh, after the injury. And he's like, well, it's over now. And Josh Johnson um, somehow has been able to hang around in the league uh, since like 2009 or 2010, whatever. I don't know when his first season was, but I remember he was on the Bucks. Like, yeah. Okay. They said he's been around 15 years, so yeah. that means he's been around. Yeah, I mean, I like remember he was on the 49ers. The, uh, that. He was on the uh, Buccaneers like in 2009 when they started out like 0-8 or whatever, but there's that. Uh, I remember he was on the Redskins uh, for a bit, uh, and, uh, you know, he's been on – he's bounced around the league uh, a bunch, but, yeah, he uh, – I guess if there's one thing to criticize about the – uh, 49ers and their roster construction is backup quarterback. I mean, obviously, the beginning of the year, you know, you're probably fine with Purdy and, um, you know, Garoppolo and uh, Trey Lance. But, you know, after that, you know, you have Josh Johnson backing up Brock Purdy. It's probably not your best option there. Uh, I mean, I have no idea what the backup quarterback market was at the time that they had to pick up Josh Johnson, you know, after the Garoppolo injury and everything. But, uh, just a situation that could have been better. Um, I guess, you know, it's hard to rely on a guy like that, especially in the championship game. Although, you know, in general, I think it's pretty tough to have to rely on the backup QB, uh, in the championship game to, you know, get you there. And, uh, you know, for a little bit, you know, they were in it, uh, seven to zero, uh, in the first quarter and then they tied it up. Uh, but you know, it was, it was always going to be an up uphill battle after that. And then, um, of course, once he fumbled and turned it over right before halftime, that was pretty much it after that. And then from there, it was just the 49ers trying to trying to keep the ship from sinking, and uh, the hole just slowly got bigger. And you know, until it couldn't no longer hold any, you know, hold itself afloat, and you know, it began to sink in the fourth quarter. And of course, Trent Williams throwing down uh, on the four, or on the Eagles defender, and um, both of them get ejected and. Um, I mean, I don't know what you can say about that, but I mean, I was like, well, it's about to become, uh, you know, boxing match here or a wrestling match. And of course I called it, I was telling my friends, I told you yesterday, the game, I think this is, you could probably call it the body back game because 
uh, Brock Purdy got hurt. And then later on, Johnson himself got uh, a concussion, slammed to the turf and everything. And Yep. Yep. Yeah, when Ndamukong Sue drove him through the turf and then landed on top of him, which is usually a penalty yeah, depending yeah, on that's, other um, quarterbacks, you know, but nothing and happened there. And, uh, then they were talking about putting in McCaffrey in as the emergency backup, which is interesting because, yeah. Yeah, well... That's what I wanted. And I have plenty of people who agreed. Him and Juszczyk, who has been an um, emergency quarterback over the years for the Niners. I'd rather those two guys together, they're two smart MFers, and both of them have a functional arm. Uh, I think they can handle a snap, a direct snap. So my idea was, let's run the wing T. Let's bring it back old school. I mean, let's see what the Philadelphia Eagles can do when they don't yeah, even no, know I... what the hell the Niners are doing. But the, I think, the, the, I think the, the, they were dominating the line so much. I guess it wouldn't have mattered. But I mean, that's the idea. Of, I was saying to the TV, I'm yelling at the TV. I'm like, I don't want Josh Johnson out there. But I'd rather have Christian McCaffrey have the ball, hold the ball every single damn play, and let him make the decision. I trust right, him way right. more than and fucking I mean, well, Josh Well, Johnson. what I was going to say is that, I mean, you have McCaffrey as the potential backup backup or emergency backup, but then also Jawan Jennings. Uh, I mean, he was a four-star recruit out of high school, and uh, you know he was ranked higher than Joe Burrow uh, coming out of high school. And he was one of the top, I think, top five quarterbacks coming out uh, in, his, in his class. And, yeah. Yeah, I saw that one yesterday. Interesting. Um, so, know, I mean, obviously, maybe it would have been tough to ask him to be the QB uh, in the middle of the game like that. But, I mean, the preparation beforehand, um, yeah. you know, if you have a former high school QB uh, on the roster that's now a wide receiver, you know, I guess if the situation calls for it, um, you know, he could have could have been there, uh, especially if, you know, he was ranked, considered, you know, one of the top uh, in his recruiting class, like I just said. So, uh, just a unfortunate situation, like we talked about, and you know, fortunately, the 49ers um, couldn't, you know, really didn't have any chance. And um, you know, the other part of it is, is um, how does this game change with you know the play calling and stuff, um, especially with the beginning of the game, the catch, you know, to Devontae Smith that should have been challenged by uh, Kyle Shanahan, um, or at least have the booth review it. Um, you know, the booth, of course. Uh, didn't review that one, and uh, that one stood. That was a fourth and three. And if you know that gets called correctly and incomplete, then 49ers start you know around midfield uh, on their first offensive drive. So you know with with that, I mean, could have could have been a little bit different in terms of you know, you know the situational uh, play calling. Um, you know where the injury happened and. Uh, down in distance versus you know starting off uh, with ha half the field and changes you know what you want to call an offense of course and um, gives you more more flexibility since you're already at midfield and if you know if you don't get that possession then you can always put them down inside the 10 yard line and then make them have to drive down the field against your number one ranked defense so that's certainly something to uh, think about there um, and of course the other end of that is is the you know with the officials reviewing that is the uh, punt that hit the TV wire or the sky cam wire or whatever and changed the tra trajectory on the punt. Uh, and then the you know officials spent like, what, like five or 10 minutes of real time trying to, to determine where the ball went and where the correct spot of the ball was and all that. And, you know, I think they were trying to, trying to use like as many angles as they could to figure out how that, um, you know, would have been placed. But then, on the flip side of that is a, how come they couldn't get the call correctly for uh, that fourth and three pass that was called complete on the field. But, you know, of course, Devontae Smith did not actually come down with possession of that ball uh, at the end of the play. So uh, that's, that's a, you know, a lot of inconsistency there. Um, you know, almost kind of like NASCAR with the consistently inconsistent calls. You know, it's been like that the whole year with uh, the NFL and really going back to the last couple of years and, um, you know, really speaks to the quality of the officials. Um, you know, it seems to not improve. And, you know, there's been several games the last, you know, five, six years that um, could have been a lot better 
uh, you know, with the, the officiating and uh, speaks to uh, volumes that, you know, they haven't been able to improve it. And even with the so-called all-star crew that, uh, that they bring out for these big games, uh, it always leads to something suspect. You know, they always advertise, like, I remember the uh, Chiefs and uh, LA Rams Monday night game that, you know, both teams scored 50 points. I'm pretty sure I remember they were hyping up that they were going to bring out an all-star crew of officials uh, for that game. Uh, you know, and and uh, th- there was a lot of interesting calls in that one. I remember that, but uh, really, really uh, kind of shows how bad the officiating is. And another point, you know, I mean, what exactly is an all-star crew? Because, I mean, technically speaking by the book, the officials should be getting the calls correct, you know, every time. I mean, that's their job. Um, I don't really know how one official can be better than the other when, objectively speaking, they both have the same job. And, um, you know, I mean, it's all it's all objective and subjective, I guess, but it is what it is. And now we get to see uh, Eagles go to the Super Bowl. I mean, uh, it's whatever. Um, interestingly enough, you know, last time Jacksonville was in this, uh, the playoffs and were significant contender in that one, uh, you know, the Eagles were also in it, and then they also advanced to the Super Bowl. So interesting correlation there. Uh, so, you know, we'll see uh, what happens and everything. And I guess, you know, for other people and, you know, cultural aspect of it, um, of course, Kobe Bryant, you know, rest in peace and everything. But, you know, he saw the Eagles win their first Super Bowl uh, back in 2017. So uh, maybe – maybe um, They'll win it again. Kobe can see it from from heaven and everything. So uh, that's another aspect, I guess, if you're a basketball guy or whatever. But um, really stretching there, but it's something to think about, I guess. But um, yeah, just a, a really lopsided game overall, and it's pretty much over after the first quarter. Yeah, it was, and I'm I'm searching here. I'm just out of curiosity now because I'm going down a rabbit hole of 2015 recruits, uh, seeing some interesting names. Uh, yeah, three stars go really far down because I'm looking at pro style quarterbacks, and I still haven't found freaking Joe Burrow. Um, man, these are I've never you know some of these guys I think might be playing in the XFL. Uh, oh, we're down to two stars, so there's no way that he'd be there. Um, yeah, Josh Rosen on 24/7 Sports was ranked the top pro uh, style quarterback. Drew Locke was fifth. Then what is it? Brett Rippin was eleventh. Kyle Shermer, thirteenth. Uh. Trying to see who else is there. David Sills, the fifth. Lovely. Uh, yeah, Kendall Hinton, uh, from the Denver Broncos, now a wide receiver. Of course, because of the vid, uh, a couple of years ago, I had to play quarterback, and it went about as good as what Josh Johnson looked like yesterday, but it wasn't his fault. And um, he had no time to prep, too, to be honest. Uh, Stidham was actually ranked ahead of Kyler Murray. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, in that 2015 rankings, never even heard of Brandon Wimbush, but he went to Notre Dame. Jawan Jennings was fifth ranked as a dual threat quarterback ahead of Sam Darnold and Joe Burrow. One who became the number one overall pick in the, in the draft and one who was drafted three overall. Oh, and Lamar Jackson was ninth. Yeah. Okay. So, oh, Kelly Bryan, I've heard of him. He was at he was at uh, Clemson. And once we go down, you know, now we're really losing the plot here. People I've never even heard of. Random. Oh, that's a name. Tucker Israel. Bryce Perkins sounds familiar. I don't know why. Um, Elijah Robinson. Um... Yeah, yeah, okay. So we'll uh, probably get into the, we'll make a preview or do a preview of the game uh, next week, honestly, because it'll be a little more fresh in that sense. 
um, in terms of some of the news and and things that is coming out regarding the game. Um, also, I I think we'll we'll um, go to some of the coaching news. Um, Kellen Moore was allowed to go and talk to the LA Chargers. Uh, for their offensive coordinator position, and he took the job. He will be the offensive coordinator now of the Los Angeles Chargers. Yesterday, um, we heard that a longtime defensive coordinator guru, Vic Fangio, is um, signed on to become the defensive coordinator of the Miami Dolphins. And becomes the highest, uh, the highest paid coordinator in the league. Yeah, so I was one. Yeah, so I'm. Yeah, I had to. You know, I'm going to read that in a minute. But um, yeah, Vic Fangio, defensive coordinator, and then Justin Herbert shoulder surgery on his left shoulder, so non throwing. Um, other things here. I was trying to go to head coach coach update on the page there. There you go. Cardinals interviewed Bengals defensive coordinator Lou Anarumo and offensive coordinator Brian Callahan. They they put a big scope, honestly. Um their past first season one under yeah. And two yeah, so I mean he was good. They called a great defense, honestly. Um, held held uh, Kansas City down pretty good, and then also Callahan had a great did a great job. He's also interviewing for Indianapolis. Uh, Mike Kafka, the offensive coordinator of the New York Giants, they've they've also interviewed Sean Payton. Defense Broncos defensive coordinator is Giro Evero, who's been getting a lot of looks. Um, Brian Flores, who works for the Steelers now, um, Lions defensive coordinator, uh, Aaron Glenn and current defensive coordinator, Vance Joseph, who also was a former head coach, Mike Flores. And then they're going to, they request an interview with uh, D'Amico Ryans of the Niners, Dan Quinn of the Cowboys, who said he's going to stay, and Frank Reich, who um, ended up taking the Carolina Panthers job, interestingly, uh, over um, Steve Wilkes, which uh, basically speaks to the hiring practices in the NFL across not just head coaching jobs, but the coordinator jobs and uh, general managers and president, team presidents and pre- president of player personnel kind of roles. Um, the Niners are actually well ahead in regards to the diversity aspect of it. Hence, you see all these people getting hired um, while other teams languish behind and they don't really pay the price for it. But, you know, it's the old boys club kind of garbage they have in that sense in regards to the old white boys club in regards to how they go and run these kind of things and it's not a great look for the league in general but that's what they want but it's a shame really uh, you're losing out on some really good new talent some talented uh, coaches and um, people that could really make a big difference I mean heck uh, Bengals gives their quarterbacks coach a contract extension I'm assuming that means they're going to move him over their offensive coordinator moves. moves. Um, Indianapolis Colts was another one. Rich Basaccia. You know they they've talked to virtual over individual round. So fifth candidate. Yes, yeah, Saturday I is being interviewed Colts for the job hired, twice. Already, oh, the Colts. I'm sorry, insane. thinking about the big um, the, Pat, Evero, the Panthers hiring Frank Reich. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Frank Reich was their coach. Um, Evero, Raheem Morris, uh, former coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and uh, Wink Martindale. 
you know, three are in the playoffs. I mean, I mean Eric B enemy is going to, uh, Eric B enemy is going to be available now because of the time week off. Uh, Shane Steichen of the Eagles is going to have time because of the week off. And, uh, Brian Callahan now because they got eliminated. So the, um, they also interviewed Bubba Ventrone, their special teams coordinator. The Lions coordinators, Ben Johnson, Aaron Glenn, Kafka, Quinn, of course, Quinn stayed. Um, Colts with D'Amico Ryans, uh, who it sounds like will be the uh, coach of the Houston Texans, bringing him back to the roster that, or to the organization that drafted him into the NFL. Um, so no official news outside of the uh, hire of hire of um Frank Reich um Broncos did actually uh interview uh, Jim Harbaugh again so that's interesting since it sounded like they were going to he was going to go back to Michigan he was committed to doing that instead of um committing to or looking towards a a pro job but I guess that's not the case. We'll see what happens with that, though. Um, we didn't do that, so that's whatever. We'll do it next week. And then Pro Bowl game, yeah. Super Bowl, yeah. So that's what we will do. Let's get into Rolex 24, man. Uh, you were there. Um, what was it like? It looked like it was a sea of humanity in there kind of look like a Formula One race in a sense in terms of the post-race, the amount of people that were there, and the amount of energy that seemed to be in this. Of course, the debut of the new LMDH cars, the AK, the GTP category, returning to IMSA for the first time in 30 years. Um so the, with with the representation from Acura, Cadillac, uh, BMW, and Porsche, amongst other things, of course, the GTD category, GT Daytona Pro and GTD, uh, boasted a bunch of new cars uh, this year, for this year, and um, some that have been around but are really good. Uh, what what was it like there? Some of the things you experienced, of course, yeah, not close to Elio, but you also got to Elio, talk to other people. You know, I was within feet of uh, getting a picture with him, but also fist bumped with Jordan Taylor, uh, you know, in the garage area coming. I think he was done with his stint and he was going back uh, to his hall or bus, whatever, to go take a nap or something. And uh, he was walking actually kind of more in the direction of the fan zone because uh, there's the gate, you know, where they – had the fan zone and then the garage area where you go to walk into it and he was walking towards the direction i think he was going to getting ready to go through the fan zone and go back to the bus or whatever but um yeah i fist bumped him said what's good he fist bumped me back and um you know he went about his business and um you know he i think somebody else like tried to get an autograph from him and autograph his hat or their hat and he did that but uh, actually, I should have got a picture of him or with him, but I guess I wasn't thinking fast enough. But and I knew he was pretty busy and everything, and just trying to uh, get about, you know, where he was going to. So I didn't want to slow down too much or anything. But you know, I said hello. So basically, so um, that's pretty cool. Of course, uh, AKA Rodney Sandstorm, the guy who uh, wears Jeff Gordon hats and the mustache and everything, and he's got the cool Instagrams and everything. Yep, and the jorts as well. Got to got to rock those the jorts. jorts. So, um, yeah, that's that's a pretty cool guy. Of course, works for Do uh, Dirty Mo Media with Dale Jr. and making uh, content over there. So, uh, looking forward to see if he's got some more uh, funny video content coming out later this year. Uh, you know, in between uh, all the racing that he's doing, but uh, I mean, as far as you know, the race itself. I mean, great experience, of course. Um, I think. This year was the most fans that they've had at the race, and uh, I mean it's probably right because when I got there, the normally the free parking that they have uh, in lot three at one Daytona across the street uh, from the speedway, they uh, was already packed, already full, so I had to go just a little bit down, parked at the uh, Volusia Mall, and 
you know, there was free parking there. So got out, just had to walk a little bit further uh, to get to the speedway, but um, was able to, you know, walk all the way to the track and everything and actually um, saw something a little bit different this time because I've never seen the uh, office, the track offices side where all the ticket windows are and everything. And, um, or well, I guess the main, like, you know, where the tours are and the museum and everything. And uh, you, I was able to walk by that and actually saw the day, the Dale Earnhardt statue for the first time. So it was actually pretty nice because um, I haven't been on that side of Daytona Speedway. It's always everything before that, but, you know, before the bridge. But saw that and then saw all the, um, you know, handprint and um, footprints of all the Daytona 500 winning drivers. And, of course, saw the two uh, Daytona 500 wins for Dale Jr. 2004 and 2014. So that was cool and everything. Um, but, you know, um, that was really interesting, of course. Um, actually, one of my friends uh, I work with here in Melbourne uh, came with me to the race. Uh, I was like, hey, you're interested in coming? And, you know, we were able to, um, you know, work out something to go to the race and came with me and uh it was actually his first time ever being at any kind of race and he said he liked it liked all the um you know the themes and everything and all the the sounds and the noises of uh, the, all the race cars and just like the entire atmosphere and said it's just you know just like a a, a theme park of race cars and you know, i said yeah it's exactly what daytona is and everything but you know that that was fun and everything and um I was able to, you know, get down down to the track, and we were able to, uh, you know, go down to the uh, speedway for a bit before the race, and that's, you know, where I was able to um, look at all the cars and everything before the race, and, of course, saw Elio. And there was also another guy, I think I mentioned earlier, he's a, in a Spider-Man suit, of course, you know, because Elio is Spider-Man of motorsports, and, of course, he won the race and climbed up onto the fence and everything, and, you know, Spider-Man, that's what he does. So uh, that was that was pretty nice, but... Um, they, yeah. And then, and then at first, like we went and went to the stands to go watch the race, uh, and saw the, you know, perspective from that. And we were able to, uh, see the start from the stands last year when I went, uh, I was in the fan zone up on the, on top of the garages. So a little bit different perspective this time. You get to see a little bit of the whole track, the first couple of laps and the opening laps, seeing all the cars, uh, begin, uh, to get, you know, their pace and everything and, uh, get, get set and um you know get into the race so that was that was a little bit of different perspective uh this year and then of course before going onto the track you know you're able to autograph the uh or sign whatever with the marker onto the track and you know of course signed my autograph onto the track and then of course uh, had to put it was always the jags on the track uh, commemorate the 2022 jag season and everything and just had to write that one on the daytona international speedway yellow line um and everything just for fun whatever but did that um we yeah we just walked around for a bit you know throughout the grandstands and was able to get a lot of different angles of uh, pictures and everything brought my brought my Nikon camera this time uh, so I was able to get some really high resolution shots which I'll share with you um, once I get all the you know good pictures and bad pictures sorted out so we'll get that situated there but you know, just a really good uh, really good experience overall and then of course uh, we met up with one of our other friends there uh, was there she was there with her dad we saw her and talked for a minute and then I uh, went about our day and we went down into the uh the garage area and the infield after that and um you know saw all the you know campfires and everything out there and all the uh, rvs and stuff and really that's where most of the people are i mean there's a bunch of people in the stands but um i think the majority and i mean this probably speaks for you know most of sports car racing and i think even you know extending out to open wheel and indy car racing a lot of the fans are in the infield um, you know, camping out for the weekend because it's a multi-day event and you can go out there and camp uh, and, you know, talk about, you know, or do whatever you want uh, throughout the weekend. And I think, you know, that's where you get a, a lot of the, you know, interaction and everything between people. And that's where the party aspect of it comes into play. But, uh, you know, we were there in the infield. I uh, went to the midway and did a lot of stuff there. Uh, went to the vendors and stuff. Uh, we went to pretty much every all all the vendors that were there. Uh, you know, Chevy, Acura, Ford, uh, Cadillac, uh, Lexus, uh, BMW. Pretty much everything that you know, all the main major manufacturers that were there. And we saw uh, pretty much all they had to offer. I was able to see the 
uh, Integra Type S uh, that's coming out later this year. Of course, it was pacing the field at the beginning of the race before uh, the race started. Um, it's not yet fully revealed yet. They still have the camouflage on it because there's, I guess they haven't gotten the full design out yet, but they had the prototype there. So that was pretty cool to see. Um, never seen a, uh, really a Honda or Acura with a, uh, you know, tri-tip exhaust, which what the Integra Type S has this time, uh, in this model. So that's going to be interesting coming out, uh, the, I think that later this year, so it should be fun. See what that's all about. And then they also had the regular Integra there, which um, people could go in and sit down in the car and try it out. So uh, both me and my friend, we went and saw uh, the inside of the car and um, you know was able to kind of mess around with the controls, mess around the stick shift, six speed stick shift there, and you know able to get in uh, the car and you know pretend like we we're driving manual and everything. So that was pretty funny, but. Uh, got a bunch of free shirts, got uh, Cadillac, uh, Corvette Racing, uh, got the uh, eBay Motors. Uh, there was a, a vendor there that had uh, shirts from them, so we got that. Um, they had the iRacing Simulator there at the BMW vendor, but uh, it was with... I was with iRacing and had the Fanatec wheel and pedal set. And so I was actually wanting to go there because they had the leaderboard up. And I think the best time with the BMW uh, hybrid LMDH was uh, minute 42. And I actually haven't raced it yet in iRacing. So I was kind of wanting to do that. And with the nice wheel pedal set set up there that they had, I was really wanting to do that. But I'd ask the, the guy at the table, like, you guys still have spots open for the rest of the day? He said, no, but we'll have some open tomorrow and everything but i was only there for saturday uh so uh wasn't able to do that but you know i have it at home so uh, i can just hop on any time but you know it's always cool to see that stuff at the racetrack and everything uh they had a similar setup over at uh lexus but it was with gran turismo uh, and i i think they had a different uh wheel uh set there so it was a little bit different but that was interesting and then of course over at Chevrolet, they had the uh, Garage 56 prototype uh, for you know for NASCAR and Le Mans. That was there, uh, so I got to see uh, that one up close and everything. Never seen a Gen 6 uh, up close yet, or you know really this is the Garage 56 car, and so I haven't seen that up close. And you know, you can see all the different modifications that they've made for that car just for Le Mans compared to you know what they run in the normal Cup Series and everything. Um, you know they've got the um, I forget what you call it, but they call it, you know, the, the fins that are on the front of the car on the fenders. Uh, yeah, I think they're like, I forgot what those are called, but um, that's one of the modifications um, to that car. Uh, you know, they've got a little bit of a bigger lip on the front, on the, you know, on the, the front valence, the splitter and everything. Uh, the back, of course, has the uh, famous big ass spoiler as known by Dale Jr. on there. So, uh, you know, was able to get a good look at that and see just how big ass spoiler it is. And it's pretty big. So, um, I can't agree or, you know, Dale Jr. is a hundred percent right on that as he always is usually. So, um, it fits the description there, but you know, it's a interesting car and, you know, we'll see how it performs in uh, Le Mans later this year. You know, we saw that there was another vendor that had, uh, the, it wasn't a sim racing thing, but it was actually like a, a drag racing like uh, simulator, I guess. So um, you were able to like you hop into the car or to the seat, and then you have the controls of uh, mimicking drag racing, and you're basically reacting uh, to you know the light and when to release and go, and um, you know, they time you and everything. And at first, you know, trying it out, like I was beating my friend, but then later on, my um, the last couple of tries, my friend beat me by. Uh, pretty big margin. I forgot the times where I think he, like I had like 0.1 or something in my friend had 0.05, uh, 10th of a second or hundredth of a second reaction time to the, to the light when, when to go for once, you know, you're reacting to when the light changes to yellow and you go on the, you know, off of the release and everything. So that was pretty interesting, but you know, um, drag racing is not really my thing, I guess, but you know, it was still pretty funny to do that. Uh, and everything but um of course just you know checked out all the other vendor shops and try to get more free stuff uh which you're able to do that and of course the shirts and i uh, also got a free water bottle and magazine so that was pretty nice um did that uh we checked out the 
Lake Lloyd, got some pictures there on the Le Mans chicane coming off, you know, turn two NASCAR going down the back stretch, uh, seeing some of the cars go down there and then, uh, you know, went back into the fan zone for a bit. And then, um, we went through the garage one time, there was no cars. And then, so we took a break and sat down in front of the projector screen in the fan zone. And then we saw the cameras flash, uh, the Porsche, uh, in, in the garage for the Penske Porsche, uh, number six. And so we we're like, okay, let's go see. So we went and go saw, they were trying to make as much repairs as they could to the car. Uh, and they were behind the wall and took a couple pictures of that. And it's pretty interesting. Um, you know, going back to what we were talking about in the last episode, you know, I thought that Porsche would have a tougher time with this race just purely because they're a new team um, this year in IMSA competition. I mean, it's not their first rodeo, of course, in the Rolex 24, but as the partnership with Penske Racing, uh, you know, in this new uh, class LMDH, uh, and, you know, being in the Rolex 24 hours this year, I thought they'd have a tougher time. And I guess I was proven right by that, uh, with the six, uh, going behind the wall. And then later on, on the next day on Sunday morning, uh, the number seven Porsche, uh, having engine troubles, uh, you know, with about three hours, uh, to go there. So, uh, I guess, guess I was proven right. And, you know, it's another prediction that I've gotten right on this podcast, uh, unfortunately, and, you know, my my one friend that was at the track with, or well, not with us, but was there in attendance as well. You know, she told me she was their their poor or she's poor person, and I was like, well, sorry, uh, that's that's what I that's what I was thinking was going to happen, but you know, it it is what it is. But uh, so that was that was kind of funny. But um, we saw that, and then we saw one of the Lamborghinis um, make repairs, and they were able to make it back out onto the racetrack. I think they had some engine problems or whatever, but um, they got the car into the garage and made made repairs to the engine. And then, um, you know, they did some tests with the motor, and then they were able to get get out and get back into the race. So uh, that was pretty cool seeing seeing stuff like that. And just in general, you know, you can feel the atmosphere uh, in the garages as they're trying to repair the cars. You know, it's a 24-hour race. They're trying to get back into the event, try to get as many you know, points as they can or positions back as they can. So, um, that was, you know, you can feel the energy there and everything. And then, um, you know, later on we went back into the, uh, grandstands after that. And then we, uh, sat kind of in front of turn one of the road course where you could see all the cars trying to break from 180, 175, all the way down to like, I think like, you know, 90 or whatever in that first corner. And, you know, some of those guys, you know, in, in just even like six, seven hours in the race, they're already, you know, um, starting to uh, lose performances in terms of braking. You know, there were some cars that were really overdriving the corner. You could see them slide, uh, smoke the, the tires um, just in the middle, in the center of that corner and, you know, trying to make the best of their time. But, you know, of course, they're either going too hard or they're already starting to see, you know, issues with their performance of their car and everything. So um, that was... You know, pretty interesting to see the handling aspect of the cars, you know, as they were, you know, just uh, maybe a quarter of the way into the race. So, um, you know, that was a pretty interesting aspect there. Uh, and then, you know, after that, I think we left about like uh, probably 9, 9.30 time frame. Uh, we headed out, uh, left the speedway and started to make our way back to, you know, down to Melbourne and everything. So uh, we stopped at Olive Garden and had pretty good service there. You know, of course, Olive Garden, unlimited breadsticks and salad and everything. So, uh, took advantage of that. So, um, and had, had some pretty good meal there about 10 PM. So, uh, and then, you know, drove home and everything. So, yeah, I mean, um, I know there's a lot, but of course, you know, the Rolex 24, um, great experience at that race as always. And, um, you know, in comparison to NASCAR at Daytona, of course, you know, I think, you really get a lot of value for how much you're paying for a ticket. You know, I, I had the, the two day pass, which Saturday, Sunday, but it came with the garage, uh, infield pass as well, which is really why I wanted it. Um, cause I wasn't going to stay on Sunday. I mean, I would probably should have stayed on Sunday, but, um, it's easier just to make it, you know, back in one day and everything. And, um, I think even for a hundred bucks, you're able to get the, the value of the ticket, um, or even hundred, I paid 70 as I bought it in November, but, um, you know, you're able to get the value of the ticket by just, you know, visiting 
the track before the race, you know, going onto the track, you know, being able to sit anywhere in, where he wants to in the grandstands, and then also being able to go into the infield and go around wherever you want there and being able to go to the garage area and see all the action there before and during the race. So I think there's a lot of value in that compared to NASCAR where, um, you know, you're paying, I don't know how many dollars per ticket, you know, where you're, you know, you might be sitting in the the lower sections or up in the nosebleeds where you get the higher view of the track and everything. But um, you know, you're paying pretty high high dollar for NASCAR, like for the Daytona 500. And then on top of that, can't even get to the um, you know the grass or the track before the race. You have to pay an extra ticket for that. You know, that usually runs 120 just to get to the fan zone and have the uh, pre race passes and everything. So. Uh, from my mind, I think you get a lot of value for your dollar just by uh, buying the Rolex tickets. But not not saying it's not a bad idea to go to NASCAR, but just saying from purely from a money standpoint, I think you get a lot of bang for your buck by going to the Rolex 24. Uh, so, you know, that's been my opinion for the last couple of years and still stands. And um, same same idea in IndyCar with uh, the uh, Grand Prix of St. Petersburg. They have kind of the same idea with the general admission pricing there and you know, you get a lot, a lot of value for your dollar there as well. So, uh, and I think really any place that has general admission and, you know, ability to visit anywhere, it's very valuable. Uh, the one thing that was different this year was, um, for that pass, for the garage passes, you were actually only allowed to go in the garage area, uh, on that side of the, of the track. Cause last year I was able to go to the garage area and the pits and, well, not inside the pits, but, you know, the area behind the pits and walk down there. But uh, this year, they're a little bit more strict and they're like, you have to have a hard card to go on that side. Uh, so I wasn't able to, you know, walk down behind the pits like I was last year. Uh, so I was a little bit different, but, you know, it's okay. Um, you know, I guess I'll have to figure out a way to get a hard card next year or later on. So, um, yeah, I mean, as always, you know, it's a fun experience and, you know, it's just a great time. Uh, at the track, great atmosphere. Uh, it's a good opportunity for, you know, if you want to practice your racing photography, which, you know, that's what I was trying to do, uh, you know, with my camera this year, with bringing the Nikon instead of trying to use the iPhone, um, you know, a real actual professional camera, change a lens and get better v zoom angles and all that stuff. Um, you know, that was kind of the goal there. It's an opportunity for that. And you have several aspects you know, points on the track where you could uh, do photography, you know, whether you're up in the stands or up down uh, by the International Horseshoe in the infield or um, off of turn four or off of turn two, backstretch, a lot of great places to do photography uh, there. So, um, you know, that was that was that part of the race and everything. That's That was my perspective, my friend's perspective and everything. And, of course, you know, I, I think try to go back in the future maybe and maybe try to do some sort of camping thing or whatever whether that's next year or later on or something like that i think it's well worth it to do that as well so yeah i mean that's my experience and glad to have done it and everything and you know hopefully hopefully there's more experience like that in the future and um you know uh as far as the race itself i mean it was a great race um you know came down pretty close to most of the classes um elio won so now he's a three-time Daytona Rolex 24 champion, in addition to being a 4X uh, Indy 500 champion. Uh, so he's, you know, slowly correct, uh, collecting a legendary resume. And of course, there's also the aspect of him potentially competing in the Daytona 500. And he's not going to do it this year, but maybe might do it next year. So there's the opportunity to uh, win the Daytona 500. So having those victories and possibly a Daytona 500, pretty legendary driver. And he can still go probably well into his 50s, I bet. I think he's like 47 now. And I mean, still looks as young as 25. He just, you know, has to apply the just for men, like you were telling me uh, before the race. So um, yeah, it was a great event and great race. Of course, LMP2 finished pretty close, came down to the last lap, last corner, kind of reminiscent of Harvick versus um, Mark Martin, 07 Daytona 500, but, um, you know, just a great uh, finish there. So great race, um, you know, first big event for 2023 uh, and kicks off the, you know, racing season officially in my mind. Yeah, it definitely was a good race and um glad that you're able to enjoy all that stuff. I do agree that 
sports car racing and indie cars and some of these other series are probably way more better of value. Part of the reason why I want to get to the six hours at the Glen uh, later this summer. So hopefully you can make that happen or I can make that happen. Uh, getting into the race itself, uh, the Acura, the Meyershag racing Acura of Tom Blomquist, Colin Brown, yeah, aforementioned Elio Castro Dash Neves and Simon Pagino win the Rolex 24 in the case of Blomquist. Castro Neves and Pagano. That's two years in a row. And uh, when it comes to, um, I'm trying to see over there, you know, one to 22, and then uh, uh, the latter do up our last year. Third straight win in the race for Elio Castro Dash Neves because he did win for the Konica Minolta Acura team for Wayne Taylor. Back uh, three years ago, or I mean two, whatever, two years ago, so now 2-1 now. So um, three consecutive wins, which is he tied uh, the late Peter Gregg for most consecutive overall wins. And um, uh, pretty interesting since it was a 50th anniversary of Brumos, Brumos's first win with Peter Gregg and Hurley Haywood, and Hurley Haywood was at the track this weekend. Um, doesn't look like he aged. He's aged in all these years. So it's one of the greatest sports car racers ever. Five-time winner of the Rolex, tied with Hi to My Family at Home. He's a three-time winner at Le Mans. An absolute go to sports car racing. So that's an interesting uh, deal there. They ended up winning by 4.19 seconds over fellow Acura, the Conoco Minolta Acura. Uh, 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 what do you call Wayne Taylor and Andretti now? Ricky Taylor, Philippe Albuquerque, Louis Delatraz, and Brendan Hartley, uh, the drivers there. And the two Ganassi Cadillacs ended up uh, finishing third and fourth, all on the lead lap. The 01, which will be the full season car with Sebastian Bourdais and Renger or Van der Zanda, with uh, Scott Dixon, the third driver, which is something to say. Um, that, that'll probably change in a couple of years when he decides to quit IndyCar or whenever he decides to quit IndyCar. Mm-hmm. Alex Lynn and Richard Westbrook will be driving in the WEC together and finish fourth in this race. Uh, the fifth place finisher was 12 laps behind. This is the last Cadillac, uh, Pippo Durrani, Alexander Sims, and Jack Aiken in the number 31 wheel and engineering Cadillac. After that, basically, it was pretty rough uh, for the, the the other date, whatever, cars in the class. I had the one thing open where it was showing by class. So I might have to actually go and look that up. But out of curiosity, we'll see. Um... In terms of after that, there was a gap there. Philip Bang, Augusto Farfis, Marco Wittmann, and Colton Herta finished sixth overall in the BMW number 24 for Ray Hall Letterman Lanigan in their first race back in the prototype category. BMW's first race back in prototype category since, I think, the year 2000. So um, long time for them being away. Um, in terms of the overall results, those are the top six. And then the LMP2 battle came down to the line was 16 thousandths of a second. Uh, James Allen driving the Proton number 55 wins over Ben Hanley, who was driving the CrowdStrike racing APR uh, 04 car. There was four cars that were on the same lap. Uh, in the number 88 AF Corsa car, uh, finished third in class, got on the podium. Uh, Guido Vandergarter, Josh Pearson, Job Van Oyter, and um, yeah, Herio in the TDS number 35 finished fourth. Um, two laps behind them were the, uh, the bus bros of Scott McLaughlin, Joseph Newgarden, 
and then owner uh, John Ferrano and uh, their other main, his, his co-driver for the year, Kiffin Simpson. A lap behind them was the Rick Ware racing car, which had uh, finishing the race, DeFrancesco. Um, Austin Sindrick, the Daytona f- defending Daytona 500 champion, Pietro Fittipaldi and Eric Lux, who will be the full season drivers there. So LMP2 cars, they were in terms of from 7th to 13th overall, separated by four laps. So uh, Ben Keating or Nicola Lapierre and a Pierre 1 Matheson in 52 had won this race last year, struggled or were doing all right, but spun out late, and that cost them a chance at the victory. The first Penske Porsche finished eight laps behind their next uh, their next uh, team there, or next drive, or next car, and um, in 14th overall, that's Matt Campbell, Felipe Nazar, and Michael Christensen were the uh, driver's and then um, the Duquesne, AWA Duquesne, number 17, dominated and won by like 30 laps or something in LMP3, um, proving once again why they, uh, well, it said 12 laps, but I thought it was like 30-something laps or whatever. Um, they were in a different time zone. I thought it was way more than that, but I guess that wasn't the case. Um that race was done largely due to the attrition and um, all the issues that came up there. Um, so unfortunate in terms of some of those other teams, the Sean Creek Porsche team and some of the other um, people that were involved in this race to not be able to finish it off or get put it away. Now it's got a be a bummer in that sense um and then you got yeah where am i look what is that uh it's so that's practice talking about practice um i was i should just go back to the um, i'll go to racer again because there is a class uh breakdown um Class by class breakdown, which was what I had before before I went on IMSA.com. IMSA's website is terrible. So yeah. Then um the only car that didn't finish outside of the uh GTP or in the GTP class was the other Porsche, Matthew Jaminet, Nick Tandy, and Dane Cameron, who will be running uh in the World Endurance Championship Pemsky Porsche. The uh, the one BMW, uh, as I mentioned, finished sixth overall. The other BMW finished last in class. Definitely struggled uh, over the weekend, but it looked like they made some uh, progress, even though they had a lot of problems. Uh, the Porsches also showed a lot of problems. Accurs had not run a lot, but they were able to make it work. And so were the Ganassi Cadillacs, to be honest. And in terms of the um, LMP2 class, you had seven cars that were within four laps by the end of the race. But the lead car in that were seven, finished 761 laps, which relative to the GTP cars they were giving up um, based on the overall 22 laps to the overall winner. So essentially a lap an hour. Uh, so I, I, the thought of LMP two possibly being able to get around the GTP cars, if unless it, the like catastrophe happened, it might've been similar to what happened the years that GT cars won the Rolex over the past. What is it? 30 years or so, uh, you know, so didn't happen though, uh, which is nice to see. Uh, but the Porsche and BMW teams definitely have stuff to work on. Mentioned uh, LMP3. Uh, they won They won the AWA team, won by 12 laps over the Sean Creek 
Lige team, Jao Barbosa, um, amongst that driving contingent, the Performance Tech 38 rounded out the podium. Uh, the, the Gar Robinson, Felipe Fraga, Van Berlo, Riley, uh, Lige blew up catastrophically early in the early in the race so they a, a pretty good contender was knocked out early in that sense the uh, Jared Andretti Gabby Charvez Rasmus Lind Andretti Autosport car uh, also had issues so they were knocked out early in the race or halfway through the race uh, JDC Miller Teams had struggles, finished 10 laps, or yeah, 22 laps off of the winner and 10 laps off of second place. So interesting there. The GTD Pro and GTD races were definitely spicy. Uh, the two retirements for Bill Oberlin and Bruno Spengler and John Edwards the Turner Motorsports BMW M4, and then the Risi Competizione Ferrari 296, Per Guidi, Collado, Sarah, Rigo, and all Ferrari factory drivers. All um, They got eliminated halfway. The Auberlin Turner car fell out with just under, uh, just over th three hours to go in the race. The... Cooper McNeil in what supposedly is his uh, last race of his uh, career has to handle business stuff with the WeatherTech company. Of course, it's his fam the family company. I think he's getting married to Katie Kearney, the Instagram uh, golf girl. So um, credit to him. Gets that poo nanny. Um, uh, Daniel Juncadella, Jewel Gunyon, and Mauro Engel, all Mercedes factory drivers, came through there to win by just under four seconds over Antonio Garcia, Jordan Taylor, Tommy Milner, the Corvette Racing number three. The third place car also on the lead lap, Jack Hawksworth, Ben Barnacote, Mike Conway, Vassar Sullivan, Lexus. Um, one lap behind was the Roman Grosjean, Jordan Pepper, Andrea Calderari, Mirko Bottolotti, Iron Links, Lamborghini, who struggled for pace early in the weekend, but obviously by the end of the weekend, they were able to get it. Uh, Klaus Bockler, Patrick Pile, and Lawrence Vantor in the FAF Motorsports. Plaid Porsche were able to finish also one lap down, fifth in class. That's good for the point situation. Not really sure who's going to run on a regular basis in the WeatherTech car. We know uh, Garcia and Taylor will be here. Um, Rodney Sandstorm, of course, that uh, Josh saw and was able to kind of have an interaction with. They're going to have something for the season. The Vassar Sullivan Lexus is someone you to look at because they've had issues in the Enduros now. They might have figured that out. Um, don't think, I think the Iron Links car was only for the Rolex. So essentially FAF probably right now would be a net third. Um, the Ross Gunn, Riberas, Pittard, Harder Racing, Aston Martin lost some ground there and the Turner Motorsport team too. The GTD category, the last one, um, Roman DeAngelis, Marco Sorensen, Ian James, Darren Turner, the Harder Racing 27 gets the victory over the Magnus Racing Aston Martin, John Potter, Ali, Andy Lally, Spencer Pompelli, and Nikki Team. Um, Aribe, Shandorf, Milroy, Kirkhofer, Inception Racing, McLaren rounds out the podium. Uh, sexy Sheena Monk, uh, Catherine Legg sporting some weird glasses these days. Mario Farnbacher and Mark Miller, the Gradient Racing. Um, what do you call, what is their sponsor, the free cash now, whatever the hell, J.G. Wentworth, um, J.G. Wentworth, uh, Acura NSX was the last car in the lead lap. Aaron Teal, it's Frankie Montecalvo, Kyle Kirkwood, 
Parker Thompson, the Vassar Sullivan Lexus in the AM category, finished fifth. Uh, Wayne Taylor Racing had another car. I mean, Andretti Autosport was connected, and he got two cars. Wayne Taylor Racing has two cars. They have an a- Acura NSX that runs only the Enduros. Uh, Marcelli, Ryan Briscoe, Ashton Harrison, Formal finished sixth. Um, they were two laps back. And uh, yeah, there's some of these other ones. Uh, Brian, the uh, Paul Miller Racing BMW, was three laps down. Porsches, in general, struggled uh, this weekend. Might have been convenient, but we'll see. The Habel Stoltz uh, Sun Energy car had issues and uh, fell out around uh, halfway. The yeah, I'm trying to look at some of these other yeah the Iron Dames team had a lot of uh, issues throughout the whole race, but the ladies were able to finish. Trying to see the you know who else was there. Um, the Korthoff car problems. They were 20 laps off the the lead. Overall, and they were a lap behind the car that was in front of them. Windward Racing, after um, having a, having to rebuild their car because one of their drivers got hurt in the roar, had to rebuild a car, were in a position, possibly contend for the victory, and then had issues again and uh, fell out of the race. So, disappointment there. So, Rolex is dead. It'll be 40 over 40 days, 43 days, it says on the website, till the 12 hours of Sebring. So another, what is it, six weeks till the 12 hours, which is what it's been. They used to have other races in between back in the old IMSA days. But we will see what happens uh, with that. Um, Did you, were there any thoughts on any of the classes in particular um, the LMP2 battle, of course, was cool at the end. The GT battles were also competitive, but I think that last restart um, played a role in how those races played out. Um, and then even in the in the GTP category, to be fair, I think the last restart kind of played a yeah, role I mean, I what think happened in general, there, like Josh. The last... I want to say three hours of the race, they're starting to have a lot of cautions pick up uh, towards the end. There is, you know, of course, the um, some of the incidents um, that happened, cars getting stuck uh, in the or- International Horseshoe and other, other places and um, in general, you know, caused uh, a lot of rebunching up of the field. And I think that's what kind of contributed to that great finish that we saw in LMP2. Um, but really in general just uh i mean up front at the gtp class the uh 60 had uh, acura they had the best car overall throughout the race and um they just had a lot of pace on restarts and um you know they were able to get away from uh the rest of their competition fairly quickly and they didn't really have too much of a challenge uh you know on on those late restarts um i think the 10 acura could have caught caught up to you know their brother in the gtp category but um they just didn't really have the long run pace compared to you know compared to the 60 and um you know just a um still overall win for both a good win for the manufacturer but um they just didn't have the the speed that the 60 did and um yeah and then the other classes like gtd and gtd pro or gtdm gtd pro um i mean it's interesting how the AM uh, class finished their their car, the number twenty seven um, Spirit of Racing. Um, you know, they they actually finished better than all the GTD Pro car, uh, cars. So that was pretty interesting that the amateur class actually finished higher than all the pros. But um, you know, I think that just shows the attrition uh, that takes place in the in the Rolex twenty four and um, you know, some. Sometimes it just happens like that, I guess. But um, yeah, I, I thought I thought in the middle of the race, you know, there was a good battle. Like 
you know, late in the night, I, after I got home, uh, I turned it on Peacock and, you know, the 79, uh, GTD and the, uh, I think, yeah, the 23 Aston Martin, you know, they were, they ever in pretty uh, good battle for a bit, you know, about, you know, two, three in the morning. Um, you know, they were pretty close with each other. And I think, you know, just overnight, uh, the 23, I guess he fell behind and, uh, fell a couple laps down to the 79. So that was pretty interesting. You know, late in the race, you know, the, um, I think the 14 Val Vassar Sullivan, you know, they had some good battles and there was a couple of times where he went below the yellow line to, I think, pass the Corvette, uh, you know, the number three Corvette towards the end. And, you know, it's so, so different how you're able to do that in sports car racing, you know, versus, you know, in NASCAR, that's obviously illegal out of bounds or whatever, or subjective, depending on who you are. Um, but, you know, it's uh, interesting how that was able to play out. Uh, but then, you know, the three, yeah, the three Corvette, you know, they've been good at Daytona in the past, but, you know, this year they just didn't have quite the pace to hang with the top of their class. But, um, you know, it was just a just good good battles throughout the field in general, and um, you know, I'm glad we got to see all of that. You know, in person, TV, otherwise, um, and then you know, I think another part of it is the teammate battle between uh, the you know zero one and the zero two in GTP, and of course, at the end of the race, you know, um, they had some pretty close battles, and then the coverage was highlighting how they got into it last year at Petit Le Mans, and uh, just a, you know, bad, bad finish there, but it renewed their rivalry here, racing each other close towards the end, but, um, just shows the intensity and, um, you know, for Chip Ganassi, you know, he wants the best guy to be the winner. So, um, shows their ability to fight, but, you know, they also are able to race with respect, uh, in that class. But yeah, I mean, just, a great race overall and you know i think gtp we're seeing a lot of attrition already of course with you know bmw had issues porsche had issues um and you know i think even you know there's even times where even the 60 they had issues just uh spinning out you know coming out of the infield uh there so you know just a, a great race overall and um you know looking forward to you know the rest of the year you know and all the other series and even in sports car racing and you know, seeing how everything plays out. So, uh, you know, I'm glad, glad to have attended again and, and, uh, you know, glad, glad to have witnessed it and all that stuff. Absolutely. It was a great, uh, debut of all these new cars and being able to get the season kind of rolling in that sense, um, get Daytona speed weeks rolling too which, uh, of course, we're going to get there for NASCAR in, a, like, what, three weeks' time, actually. So it'll be great to see. Uh, we'll get into uh, the NASCAR news of the recent week here. Our sponsorship news for uh, Roush, Fenway, Keselowski, uh, Trackhouse, Legacy Motor Club, the one piece of news I saw, or two pieces of news I saw, were, oh no, well, I'll keep on counting them. But Toyota supposedly is looking to add teams, which is the first time we've ever really heard that uh, in a while, uh, or in general. Which I think in the end, NASCAR, as it stands right now, would like to have in regards to the chartered teams, each manufacturer have 12 cars, I think in a perfect world. And um, have it split evenly across the board. But Toyota right now is only at six. Chevy generally has a majority of the teams. Ford has two major teams in Penske and Stuart Haas. And then some lesser teams uh, that are out there. I mean, Penske's got four cars. Stuart with the, with the what do you call, Wood Brothers. You have four Stuart Haas cars. Then you have the Roush RFK, that's two with Front Row Motorsports, that's two, so um, that's 12. I don't think there's anything past that. Uh, or front, yeah, I said, I said Front Row, right? Or RFK and Front Row. So uh, in terms of uh, there's talk about 
um, Amazon with the, uh, I guess, Amazon Prime joining a possible new uh, TV rights package uh, based on news that's come out through Adam Stern. They, they it looks like um, NBC and Foe are going to stay uh, involved uh, with this next contract. And then there's another piece. I mean, he also put out that uh, they want uh, the owners and teams want a bigger piece of the pie and get more money because obviously the NASCAR is kind of cooking their books and not trying to pay the owners and the teams what they deserve. You'll see what happens with yeah, he that. Wrote about that. I think I Stern did week. write about that. Adam Stern. So, yeah, yeah. So um, that's those are things to catch. Uh, another big piece was the Garage 56, which Josh mentioned. Uh, I think you were, I was yeah, going to write it planes, to yep. you, but you're talking about the dive planes uh, on the front. On the, I was just trying, I, I forgot what they were too. So while you were going through that, I, I was somehow or another able to find an article uh, from back a few months ago when they started testing the car. Speaking of that, the guy who's been the lead test driver is Mike Rockenfeller, a former winner of Le Mans and other major sports car races. Uh, he will be the lead guy on the Garage 56 entry, along with one Jim Johnson, owner, co-owner of Legacy Motor Club, and returning to cup racing after uh, going and running IndyCar for a year and change post NASCAR retirement. And then Jensen Button, the 2009 Formula One world champion, uh, spent a lot of time recently running GT, uh, running, I think, world challenge type racing in Europe and uh, going and spending time, I get classic car driving, but then also he works for the, uh, the Sky F1 team for on TV. So it'll be cool, interesting combination there. And uh, they're going to start ramping up testing, trying to get all the thing kinks and problems that they may think they could have out of the way. Chad Knauss is running it. So his attention to detail speaks to them being able to do all right. I mean, albeit it'll be um, an unclassified car, but. It sounds like what Canals and company want is a car that could basically be at the back end of GT, the GTE category, which isn't a bad thing. Um, but I will see the big contrast between that car and a GTE, or and then obviously when it comes to prototypes. Uh, there was there's Xfinity testing at Charlotte Motor Speedway to try and um, get rid of the skew. Uh, with the rear head, rear end housings, there's uh, driver news, and that Joe Graf Jr. for some effing reason still has a career, and now he's driving for our RSS Racing with their Stuart Haas Alliance. Now Raj Jacques Ruth uh, is going to run some races, like select races for Alpha Prime. A couple of other random things. You got uh, Galding returning. At first time in a few years to drive for SS Greenlight full time. Parker Chase, a Trans Am driver, will um, run select races. Sam Hunt, some other sponsors, and other so a lot of drivers for Sam Hunt. Uh, you got Tyler Reddick will be another one running for them. Uh, it was unfortunate news that came out earlier today that. Uh, NASCAR truck series driver and probably former West series driver for um, what do you call uh, the D for D team rev racing. Uh, Max Gutierrez um, was injured in a car accident uh, on Sunday and his brother Federico passed away. So our condolences to the Gutierrez family at this time. Uh, it's a tough thing for sure to lose a loved one, lose, I mean, just in general. So 
going and thinking of them at this time. There is speaking of loss. Uh, there is Reum Brothers Racing had uh, fire at their team shop, and they had planned on moving over to Ford this year. So lost a lot of stuff, a lot of equipment, and I think the truck series loads into Daytona on uh, probably the 13th or 14th. So they got two weeks to really get everything together um, and hopefully be able to compete. Uh, I think we mentioned that Clyde's going to be running the 35. Or no, he didn't. So he'll be running a, the second McAnally Chevy at Daytona because um, regular driver is not eligible due to not being 18. So that uh, Jake Garcia will be there at Las Vegas. Um, you have... Yeah, so they got that. Mason Massey announced uh, joining Real Brothers, but we'll see how that's affected with the fire that they had there. Wallace Allen, one of the greatest names in the history of motorsports, uh, gets uh, keeps his ride at Nice. Uh, you have Hosevar with Worldwide uh, WWEX. You know, coming back as a main or primary sponsor. So he'll be back for Nice Motorsports. Seeing things kind of fall into place there. And, uh, yeah, so we got through all that, got through all that. Let's, um, do you have any thoughts, Josh, on any of the news items? I mean, uh, yeah, we, starting, uh, you know, with went the over there? Amazon, uh, you know, con potential contract with, uh, you know, NASCAR and everything, that's going to be an interesting deal. Um, you know, I think, you know, we've seen what they've been able to do with Thursday Night Football and how much money that they're putting into that. You know, they're putting in billions of dollars uh, into that deal. So if they put in, you know, billions of dollars into NASCAR, it could change the financial, you know, prospects of this, um, you know, the series of the uh, trucks, Xfinity and Cup. Um, could improve things, and that's also why you're also seeing the uh, owners and teams uh, trying to negotiate for more money, uh, in you know, as part of the share. And of course, you know, if Amazon's going to bring in uh, a ton of money, then of course they're also going to want uh, to have more share uh, rather than keep the existing uh, proportion here. But I mean, it should be interesting, you know, with uh, you know the uh, TV deal and, you know, if, um, they're able to play it out, uh, or, you know, get anything, uh, there. And then also, um, kind of, you know, with the way Amazon's been covering, you know, the series, uh, where with NFL and Thursday night football, uh, could see different, uh, you know, camera perspectives, um, maybe some of the AWS statistics, uh, with NASCAR and could help bring in some of the uh, coverage aspects that we've seen from Formula One uh, implemented into NASCAR. So that might be interesting uh, perspective there uh, that we, we get from a potential Amazon uh, contract with NASCAR. So should be interesting. And then, uh, you know, I think the, Xfinity series, you know, they changed the skew for the cars and, it's going to be interesting to see what comes out of this because uh, the you know, last couple of years, the Xfinity series certainly has had the best racing, I think, uh, throughout, you know, all the tracks, of course, short track racing, road courses, uh, even the mile and a half to an extent have been pretty interesting, uh, a lot, a lot better than in the cup series. Uh, but now the skew, um, increases or taking away the skew, uh, increasing dirty air, uh, Jeremy, um, not Jerry Mullins, uh, Jerry Clements had uh, discussed that and said that there was a lot of uh, increase in dirty air compared to the way that was before and not really sure why they had to change the package. But, you know, it seems like, you know, teams have made a lot of gains in aero over the years in Xfinity. And I guess it was time, and especially since they changed the body a couple years ago. But I think, you know, the teams you know they made so many gains the nascar has kind of had to wipe 
the slate clean basically and uh, go with the reset of the rules, I guess, or well, reset of the package in a way uh, to get uh, the teams, you know, on an even footing again. So uh, we'll see how some of these tracks, uh, bigger tracks like you know Las Vegas, California Speedway, Charlotte, uh, Texas, and uh, you know Nashville Super Speedway, Phoenix, all these um, tracks that you know where we see dirty air. Uh, take effect. I mean, Pocono, uh, for crying out loud, uh, forgot about that one. Homestead, you know, is another one, although there's a lot of lane choice, but, you know, it's interesting how that's going to play out. Um, in the past, you know, NASCAR has modified the skew of the cars in the cup series. It seems like it really put a lot of importance on how, you know, how much of a, you know, you, input you had in the car uh, as a driver, you know, taking a different line versus taking another line. And it seems like when the skew changes happen in the Cup Series, um, uh, it really changed the handling of the cars and um, how they were affected in dirty air and made a really important uh, emphasis on, you know, what type of line you were taking into corners. So I wonder if the same thing will happen here uh, with this rule change. But um yeah, I mean that's. I think those you know those two things that really stood out to me you know throughout uh, some of the uh, news that you went over. But um, we'll see. You know, with Amazon, you know, I think that could be a good. Yeah, I mean, they've never covered NASCAR, and I'm sure they'll use existing personalities. Like, um, you know, they'll probably steal somebody from Fox or NBC, or they'll get somebody new. Maybe maybe that's where Alan Bestwick is going to go. Uh, he'll cover for Amazon. <laughs> we'll see, but um, it should be interesting, and maybe they'll make the coverage similar to how Sky Sports does the international feed that we see on ESPN for Formula One, but we'll have to see what happens uh, if they're able to get a contract next year. Yeah, I think that would be... I think it's what they said for starts in 2024 or it starts in 2026, I guess. It's open in 2024 and it would start in um, 25 or 26 there. So we'll see what happens with that on the TV side. And uh, yeah, I mentioned also with Jensen Button, he'll be um, running the Garage 56. But he also put out there, put a feeler out there that he might be interested in running, running road courses in NASCAR. Uh, so that would be something. Um, uh, that would be interesting to see if another Formula One world champion come here. Shaq Villeneuve has uh, tried his hand Kimi. at uh, NASCAR. Of course, Kimi last year in the Garage Project 91 deal. I'm trying to think off the top. That goes back a long ways. Uh, Mario and Mario Andretti, of course, did it prior, well prior to when yeah. he won world, his world championship. Jim Clark ran NASCAR yeah. back in the day. Uh, Nobody else. I mean, I'm try I don't think there's anybody of... Of main yeah. major ilk that I mean, won championship, ilk. whatever that had done yeah. it recently. A lot of IndyCar people, right? Yeah, but Montoya didn't. He won races, not a championship, but yeah, Montoya was the one that ran the longest. I think IndyCar guys uh, were the ones like Cornish um, and Smoke, but they ran IRL. I mean, Dario flamed out in stock cars and it worked out for him. Uh, there's, I'm trying to think other indie car people, but you know, there's not a whole lot there. We'll see what, if J Jensen does, he spends a lot yeah. of time running GT three type cars. So wouldn't be too big of a transition for him. If he wanted to come over to this, yeah, uh, real quick Gen on that seven, one, Jensen, you know, uh, we could vehicle. link up with uh, Tony Stewart and, you know, get some soda cookies and all that stuff. So there's opportunity for that. There's nothing wrong with soda cookies. Um, I think Tony has had to stop eating as many since he's with uh, Leah these days. 
But the minute I heard that and I heard he was doing Garage 56, I think I posted it somewhere. He has to go, Jensen better start eating soda cookies for sure. That was one that, of my that commercial NASCAR was commercials. Fun, really funny. I, I honestly, one when they, one when, when they, they went and did the digital effects so that Tony could actually do the splits, which is hilarious in its own right. And then they top it off with the soda cookies. That, that, that was I actually great tried job by whoever did that commercial for that mobile. Bad. <laughs> <laughs> they aren't that bad. I've tried it too. So they are not bad. So um, we'll see what happens with that. If Jensen would cop to actually trying soda cookies or not. But we will see. He's got plenty of time between now and when he has to jump in the car for, for real at Le Mans. I will move to the roundup, short and sweet. This uh, this week, the race of champions on uh, Norway, which is the uh, father son duo of Petter and Oliver Solberg, won for won the uh, the what do you call T Nations Cup. I'm trying to see who else. They don't bother to put the standings there. And the Nations Cup, I'm saying, in Oregon, both contributed to quarterfinal in France, semifinals, younger soul book. Yeah, so they beat the Swedish combo of uh, Ekstrom and Christofferson in the semis. Then they raced... The team all stars, which was two T drivers that didn't have a second driver, so they're combined with each other. Uh, Felipe Drogovic, the defending Formula Two champion, world champion, and Thierry Neuville, longtime uh, world rally championship competitor. They knocked off Team Germany in the semifinals. Interesting. So those were the top two. Then you had Germany and and Nor and Sweden, which makes sense uh, in terms of uh, the day itself or the next day. Um, trying to go through CE Rock. Uh, mentioned we're getting past Finland team. They don't bother to put any real detail in that. The Americans obviously uh, didn't do much anything in the actual race of champions for in individual drivers. Matthias Ekstrom uh, becomes a four-time winner of this event, a former two-time DTM champion. He's run in many different categories, runs Royal Rallycross. Uh, beat, he was emotional yesterday because he ended up racing Mick Schumacher in the final. Matthias Ekstrom had beaten... Uh, Mick's father, Michael, twice. And um, so that's a big deal for uh, for uh, Matthias Ekstrom there. In terms of the semifinals, he beat Thierry Neuville, uh, but also about the 26 World Rallycross champion, the 2016 World Rallycross champion. That's Ekstrom also has won that. Yep. And then the other semifinal was all Germany, uh, Mick Schumacher against his mentor, the now retired four-time world champion Sebastian Vettel. So that was, um, yeah, Neuville gets uh, eliminated, Oliver Solberg. Um, Sebastian Loeb lost to Neuville as well. So that's quite a, quite a, a job by Thierry Neuville to get all the way over there. Beating low, beating, um, yeah, and then what is it? Uh, Oliver Solberg beat his dad in the first round there, too. So interesting. Um, and then Newville beat Oliver, then ended up losing to uh, the eventual champion. Travis Pastrana got knocked out in the first round by Ekstrom, and Johan Christofferson, uh, the teammate of Matthias Ekstrom, uh, in the day before in uh, quarterfinals. So he had a tough road for sure. 
Um, the other piece is Saudi, the Saudi Epri, which was last weekend. Uh, they ran two races there. The pole winner was McLaren, uh, McLaren's Jake Hughes. Mitch Evans was second. Rene Rast for McLaren. Buemi for Envision. Pasco Verline for Porsche, the top five. Jake Dennis, the winner at Mexico City, finished um, or started, started, uh, yeah, sixth. Eduardo Motara, seventh for Maserati. Stoffel Van Dorn, defending world champion, uh, eighth. Sam Bird, ninth. And Maximilian Gunther, tenth for Maserati. The, um, I know that was for, that was for the race two. I apologize. Um, race one, Buemi qualified on pole over JQ, Sam Bird, Dan Tictum, and Rene Rass. So McLaren's were pacey for sure in qualifying trim. Mitch Evans, the Mahindra duo of Luca De Grassi and Oliver Rowland, Pasco Verline, Nick Cassidy were the um, top 10 for the grid. And then. In the race one, the results saw Pascal Verline win for Porsche over Dennis and Bird rounds out the podium. So that's uh, and then Sebastian Buemi fourth, Rene Ras fifth, Cassidy, John Eric Verne, Jake Hughes, Andre Lauderer, Mitch Evans uh, round out of the top ten. Stoffel Van Dorn just outside of the top ten there. In race two. Going into the race, the Verline gets that win over Dennis and Rast, Bird, Hughes, Buemi, Evans, Sasha Fenestraz, Eduardo Mortara, and Dan Tictum. Uh, Van Dorn again finished 11th in that race. So, heading to in a couple weeks' time to Hyderabad for the for India's first Formula E race. Pascal Verlein on the strength of two victories and a second is holds a six-point lead after yeah, sweeping both races there over Jake Dennis. And then there's a huge gap to Sebastian Buemi, who is 37 points behind and third uh, to the leader, that is, and 20 one points or 30 yeah 31 points 2020 31 points behind uh, Jake Dennis you know best finish of fourth for Buemi um Sam Bird didn't score points in Mexico City finished third and fourth in Saudi um, Jake Hughes has two fifths and an eighth so far trying to go through here something else who actually, you know, there's the three drivers that have won so far this year. There, it's, I'm trying to see who else. 16 drivers have scored points, at least a point so far this year. Uh, Gunther, Nato, Roland, Muller, Sete Kamara, and Keldon, Kevin Van, Vanderlinda have not scored points, so it's something to look at for future. And we'll get into that next week in the uh, preview that for episode 155 of the GSP uh, and also the roundup. Uh, Bushlight Clash at the Coliseum will have its a chartered field, so all the chartered cars show up. 36 cars, 27 will um, make the main event. So there's um, the official or the last. This this entry list is from my birthday on the 26th. I think there might be a couple of adjustments to what we see because they don't have sponsors listed for Kevin Harvick, Kyle Busch, Yaley, um, Reddick. I think Reddick is going to do Money Lion though because there's a commercial with him and Bubba. Uh, talking about that 
and then Cody Ware. So those are the guys. Um, the 15 car last year at the with Ryan Priest at the wheel made the main event and had a decent starting spot. So that's something. I'm trying to remember what I mean. I know Joey Logano won the race last year. I watched it. Um, they'll be qualifying uh, to for the all the positions on Saturday the fourth. Then there will be everything else will take place on February fifth. Four heat races will determine the first part of the field. Uh, top four positions in qualifying will take the per, per, respective poles in those races. Then after that, um, there will be two LCQs where three drivers make it out of their heat races are 25, LCQs 50, and then the clash itself, 150 laps with 27 drivers starting. I'm trying to see what else is here. Uh, yeah, so I went through the the list of drivers. Um, I guess, uh, Josh, uh, you can go first in regards to your thoughts. Or maybe do you want to wait? I'll let you wait with the algorithm, and you can give your picks and all that um, in a minute. I'll let, I'll let you do that. Um, I'll give this in terms of my pick for the race on Sunday. I'll go with uh, Ross Chastain to win um, the clash. My uh, dark horse pick uh, would be. I think my dark horse pick would be. Eh. There's some guys that actually ran really well and then got sent back. I mean, I'm trying to figure, remember how um, Phoenix went last year uh, and Phoenix and Martinsville. I'm trying to go and compartmentalize those and see which things worked. So they don't even have the links for any, or they don't have the links conveniently for those races they got rid of all the links for all their races um up to the opens or the yeah that's this may be from this year okay maybe that's why <laughs> that would help um yeah so phoenix the you now was earlier in the year then talk about richmond Martinsville's Will Byron. Um, trying to see where else that would probably be a good uh, basis for uh, that. So let me bring that up too. I did pick Ross Chastain, though. I'm going to stick with that one. Kind of feel like uh, based on the the way that everyone was talking about him or treating him. After some of the races this past year, um, he's out to prove something. Even though he finished second in points last year, I think he definitely wants more. So it would be a good start to the season. And of course, Joey Logano won the race and in November. He also went and ended up going and winning at Phoenix. So um, get through all that. The... I'm trying to see who finished. Yeah, Logano, Blaney, Jastain, Briscoe finished fourth that race. That was nice. Um, William Byron, or Kevin Harvick, fifth. Um, I don't know if you can really call Kevin Harvick That's a wild a card. I think it's really stretching it, but so I'll, yeah, I'll leave that. Yeah, it was, it's a big stretch because it's his last race anyway. Or last, uh, um, oh yeah, you know what? Now, I yeah, I can go with that one, though. I'll go with Brad Keselowski. Um, it is a wild card because for two reasons. One, he was Daryl god-awful last year for a good part of the year. Two, they were one of the cars that were eliminated from the main event in last year's running of this race, along with Christopher Busher. So both RFK cars 
had to sit there. They were out of the main event. So um, Brad Keselowski um, would be my wild card pick for the Clash. I'm not sure if you have any um, other thoughts, but just let us know what you're thinking and, and what your picks would be. Well, Josh, I think for you know in general. Clash. I mean, it's been a year now since this car has come out. Uh, the Clash last year, of course. It's a pretty interesting race, um, but then at the end, you know, two of the best drivers in the series, you know, ended up being the series champion, Joey Logano, coming out and winning the race. But uh, we saw a lot of some of the issues that we've seen throughout the you know beginning of the 2022 season came out in this race. Uh, you know, we had a lot of crashes, a lot of uh, you know short track, you know, hard, tough racing. But uh, I mean, from the setup side. Yeah, I'm wondering how. Yeah, I'm wondering how this is gonna come out based on, uh, you know, based on you know how uh, the teams have had a year of notes. Um, I mean, they've only had you know one race at this track, but they've had 36 other races to, well, not all 36 races, but certainly. Um, many races so that to get perspective off of and know what worked, know what doesn't work. Uh, things that they can try out in this event, of course, doesn't count for anything that they could gain for later in the year. Um, and um, it's going to be interesting, I think, just from that perspective. And um, I, I think that, you know, the best teams are going to come out and be competitive in this race, the best drivers. Uh, and it's going to be interesting to see how some, you know, the new drivers and new teams uh, come out and play in here, uh, you know, in this race. So I'm thinking, well, I'm not, I'm going to say what I think first, but I'm very curious to see how Kyle Busch comes out, you know, and, and performs in RCR equipment for the first time ever. Uh, you know, I mean, it's a short track, so it should be interesting. Of course, Austin Dillon finished third in this race last year. Uh, Tyler Reddick was uh, up there as well and led a ton of laps, uh, second most to uh, Kyle Busch. So uh, there's, you know, good, pretty good baseline already for Kyle Busch just in RCR equipment for this race. And he himself finished second in this race last year. So um, it's going to be, you know, if he's able to win, that's going to be a pretty good start to the year for, you know, the new era for Kyle Busch and uh, the number eight uh chevy for richard childress racing but um that's kind of you know what some of my thoughts on this race are really but um for the picks you know you talked about the algorithm and you know i got to thinking while we've been you know talking throughout the show and how we're going to do it for this year it's still going to we're still going to do the old way we've been doing it you know with the excel sheet and um you know picking a number out of a hat basically with the excel sheet uh and everything but you know it with all the rage with AI recently, uh, the last, you know, couple of weeks, month, uh, and everything, you know, chat GPT is kind of taking over, um, you know, the world and everything with, um, people trying to use it for different things. So I thought, you know, maybe let's try to, you know, implement a little bit of chat GPT here on this show. Um, and so I asked, I mean, you have to be kind of general with these questions here, uh, and ask, um, you know, what, what it can um, do and everything. Uh, and you know, I was trying to, trying to ask like what, you know, who is the best, you know, in NASCAR. Uh, and it said, you know, for short track racing, you know, the, some of the best drivers are, uh, Brad Keselowski, Danny Hamlin, uh, Kyle Busch, uh, Joe Ligano and Martin Truex Jr. Uh, and, so I went and asked, okay, from those drivers on short tracks, uh, you know, can you provide a statistical par comparison between Kyle Busch, Joey Logano, Martin Schoch Jr., Brad Keselowski, and Denny Hamlin at tracks 0 0.5 miles or less in length because that's about the closest we can get to uh, the Clash of Coliseum's uh, track length, which I think is about a quarter mile in length. Uh, so from that, what, are, what I'm able to um, get at is – you know, it, it said uh, it can provide a general comparison of the performance of these drivers at short, you know, half mile tracks or less in length based on their uh, Cup Series statistics. And it says, of course, however, it's important to note these 
These statistics may not be fully representative of their overall performance at tracks of this length and can vary from race to race. Additionally, this comparison does not take into account other factors that may impact a driver's performance, such as uh, change in teams like Kyle Busch, uh, crew chief, car setup, among other things. And so it says, Kyle Busch has a NASCAR Cup Series average finish of 12.0 at tracks half mile or less in length. Joey Logano has an average finish of 11.5. Martin Truex has an average finish of 12.7. Um, Keselowski average finish of 12 or 13.2. Denny Hamlin average finish of 12.3. And so using the algorithm, using well, ChatGPT, we can infer that. Joey Logano uh, has the best chance of winning this race at the Clash. Of course, won the race last year, so uh, I will go with Joey Logano with the help of ChatGPT determining all this stuff. Joey Logano winning the Clash, going back-to-back -back and starting off 2023 just like he ended 2022 and began it. So there you go for that. You know, as far as wild cards uh, in this race... Um, I mean, it's there's a lot, a lot you can go with, but you know, I'm I'm gonna go one. Um, let's go with uh, Eric Jones as a wild card, uh, and I guess as a you know maybe another guy as a wild card. Um, you know, throw in Bubble Wallace, why not? Uh, you know, he's had a lot of improvement over you know 22, so let's see what he can do first. Um, event of 23 so there's my two wild cards along with Joel Logano winning the race and first race as a married man to Amanda so congrats to them of course so we'll see what happens there he had him like mid-range pace last year one of his best tracks is Martinsville a year another year with um or Bowie Barker and then Denny Hamlin's help. I think that'll be something. And the last thing we have to do before we move into your sim segment, Josh, is who's going to end up missing the show? Because I think it did play a part. There, There is something to uh, what happened for the RFK team. They thought that they were all right, but they really weren't. In the end, they recovered and won both duels a couple, two, three weeks later at Daytona, had good pace in the 500, but then also struggled for a good part of the season. Um, you look at this field, I mean, nine cars out of the 36 aren't going to make it. I mean, Ty Dillon did have a good run in this race uh, last year. It'll be his first race for fire. I mean, you can go. Uh, you can go chalk. I feel like going chalk isn't probably a bad idea. I think um, the wear cars are going to get eliminated. The spire cars. Um, so that's four. B.J. McClaw definitely five. And I say definitely, then he'll make it. But um, after that. After you eliminate the real back marker efforts, there's going to be some tough uh, choices to knock out. And I'm not sure if he AJ was. drove. I don't think AJ was in this race, or maybe he was. I don't. Okay, all right. And I think yeah, I, Haley was because I know year. Haley got taken was out pretty good Larson. in this race. So yes, yeah, so, Larson. So. I was I was wondering if you didn't have any experience. I know I know Austin Sindrick yep. was basically a dart without feathers in this race. Um, Daytona Five Hundred Champion coming from the sports cars. I'm gonna I'm gonna go a little crazy. I'm gonna go and say Sindrick misses the show. Now that would make it uh, was it six? So. After that, um, I think Martin Truex misses the show. Seven, 
I I mean, I think there's a lot going on in his life. He's not going to be able to um, really put something together for this race, but I think by the time they go to Daytona, he'll be in a better mind space. I feel like Gagson's going to hit the wall. And I also think that Keebler's going to hit the wall. So based on that, I think that's nine, right? Or if I miscounted, it's eight. But I feel that's nine. What are your thoughts on Josh for who do you think will be eliminated other than the yeah, general I mean, I, chalk uh, picks? I agree with you on some of those chalk picks. You know, I think overall those get eliminated and everything. But, you know, once you thin out the easy picks, it starts to get interesting. And, you know, I, I'm going to say that Alex Bowman gets eliminated. Um, I think that's pretty significant pick. Um, you know, I think he's kind of always been the Hendrick car that's struggled, uh, new crew chief, of course, this year, you know, maybe they still aren't gelled quite together or they get in an accident or something and, uh, get, you know, taken out of the race. Uh, so I, I think, I think, uh, Alex Bowman gets eliminated here in this one. Um, maybe another guy that gets eliminated. Uh, I mean, if you want to go, uh, you know, with another, uh, elimination, I guess, um, you know, it's pretty tough, but I mean, you already mentioned a big name in Cindric. Uh, I'm going to say Chris Bell. Why not? Um, I mean, he's pretty good at short track racing also, but you know, I can see him getting taken out in one of these, um, uh, qualifying races, uh, potentially and seeing something like that. So I think Alex Bowman, I think he definitely struggle on handling. And then let's say Chris Bell, something happens to him. Uh, cause I, I don't think that they would have something, you know, mechanically or have issues with handling. I think they've, you know, they made it to the final four, so I don't think they'll have that problem, but I could see them, you know, last lap or something, get taken out in an accident or whatever and miss the show that way. Oh, two more. Yeah, two more. four there. So you okay, need so to I got Bowman, pick two more. Bell. You pick okay. Bowman and Bell. So, uh, hmm. you know, I'll go with. I'll, I'm going to eliminate. Uh, let's see, and I'll eliminate uh, Todd Gilliland and Ricky Stenhouse. Yeah, I think I think he gets eliminated too. So, yeah. For the oh, Richard aspect, that's right. Richard. So Todd Gillen, Ricky Stenhouse, and Alex Bowman and Chris Bell. Oh, yeah. Okay. So we'll put those in there. Josh, Clash, Elimination, Outside, RWR, Spire, Live fast. Now, it could also be determined by qualifying some of these teams. Those crappier teams, I put a lap together. Some of them may just be what they are to be determined. You know, Bowman, Bell, you know, Bo Richard, and Gilliland. You know, I think the Upset pick theoretically would be uh, would be Bell yeah. on your side because he finished in the final four um, and made his he's made his bones on short tracks. I think on my side you can make an argument whether the Sindrick pick or Truex pick is uh, the wild card, but it could end up being a complete smorgasbord could be so all different drivers so something we will see next week we'll go over that on the gsp oh, let's move on man and uh get into the sim segment and what's going on in the world of iRacing yeah, of course, and other um, gaming yeah iRacing this week uh i think they've got for 
the BMWs, the new BMW cars, uh, they've got a challenge going on at Daytona uh, this week, and I think it's like whoever can score the most points uh, throughout the week uh, racing at Daytona on the road course. I think there's like some sort of challenge or whatever, and you get a prize of some kind. Uh, I was trying to see if I could find that, like more details, but it, it seems seems pretty interesting here. News, um, BMW M Sim Cup this week at Daytona. The BMW Sim Cup pits i racers from around the world against one another on legendary racetracks, competing behind the wheel of the BMW M Hybrid V8 GTP or the BMW M4 GT3. And this week's event uh, sends racers to the Daytona Road Course and you know team up with another driver and a series of 120 minute multi-class racing uh series and see if you have what it takes to stand up at the top of the podium open to the entire community with prizes available to those who qualify the top split uh top split podium finishers in each class will earn a thousand five hundred and two fifty dollars and the top 10 finishing teams will also earn uh, series points and then the season uh tw top 12 teams in the sim cup return earn additional uh, cash prizes up to $1,500 on the line for the champions. So that's pretty interesting. I have to see if I can compete in that um, throughout the year. Uh, should be an interesting one. I don't know if I would make top split, but it's always fun to be in a series uh, specifically designed to have uh, monetary uh, you know, prizes. So that should be something to, uh, to potentially look at here in the you know, next couple of weeks. Uh, otherwise, uh, I mean, you have the normal, you know, I racing series that we compete in every week. Of course, uh, you know, on the road side, starting off there, um, you got, uh, let's see, touring car turn racing challenge. Of course, that's the uh, cars with like, such as the Hyundai, uh, uh, what is it, Hyundai Velocitor and um, you have the Honda Civic Type R. Uh, they're racing at Brands Hatch Circuit Grand Prix uh, layout this week. Uh, MX-5 Cup is at uh, VIR, Virginia International Raceway. Got uh, Long Beach uh, Street Circuit for the Indy Pro 2000s. Um, got, let's see here, Skip Barber's at the Chicago Street Circuit. So that's the uh, Skip Barber cars. Uh, on the uh, Chicago street circuit that the uh, Cup cars and the Xfinity cars are going to use later this year in the streets of Chicago, uh, which I racing designed uh, a couple years ago. Um, you've got the supercars racing at Mount, yeah, Mount Panorama. Uh, I racing GR Cup, so that's the toy, yeah, Toyota GR86 cars racing at Tsukuba circuit, uh, th the 2000 full layout. So um, that's a pretty fun track. Uh, raced that one on Gran Turismo, and that one's also on iRacing. That's always a fun track, and you know I've enjoyed racing the Toyota GR86 cars uh, so far uh, since it's come out. It's a pretty fun series. Um, let's see here, uh, Ferrari GT3 uh, fixed series at Silverstone Grand Prix layout. That should be interesting on the road side. Uh, let's see LMP2 prototypes at VAR. Uh, yeah, IndyCar. AKA known as US Open Wheel B, Delara IR18. Uh, that's going to be at the boot, uh, 29 lap race, Watkins Glen. Uh, so that should be pretty interesting there. Um, let's see, I think that's pretty much all the series on the, the roadside that could be of interest or um, potentially something that I'd like to do. Uh, oval side here, apply that, uh, change the schedule. ARCA is at Thompson Motorsports Park. Uh, that's one one of the tracks up north. That's a really nice little short track to run on. Uh, you've got the Truck Series, iRacing Class C Truck Series, racing on the LA Coliseum uh, track. So that's going to basically be the clash for the trucks. Uh, and then you've got the Atlanta Motor Speedway 2008 oval layout with uh, the Xfinity Series. Then Cup, I think Cup is at la coliseum this week because obviously it makes sense for them to be on the la coliseum for this week since it's the clash uh, then the uh, legend series is at uh, milwaukee mile this week 87 cars at milwaukee mile so should be interesting there 
Uh, last week they were at Talladega. That was some good racing there. I think I did one one race, uh, but yeah, I had had some interesting racing there, uh, trying to go from the back to the front, uh, not quite making it until the end. So a lot of a lot of good racing there. So yeah, as always, you know, I racing course, you have you know just highlighted a lot of different racing series, cars, tracks that you can combinations that you can try out. Um, so you know, of course always always a fun time trying to race on iRacing and you know get get in that racing experience get in you know your all that seat time uh yeah it's been been interesting so far this year on iRacing and you know would like to continue to uh play on it uh gonna be a little bit this busy this week with work but should be able to have some time on the weekend to be able to get back to it so um you know of course if i stream of course you can follow at twitch tv slash you sailor 2 and go on there follow my stuff and see you know all the stuff i have uh, and everything there so um yeah that's it for me for a sim segment you know say my stuff for um you know my handles and all that stuff and close the show uh she lou phil um as always you know follow twitch tv you sailor 2 all my stuff on there uh for racing sim racing and um any other gaming stuff that i got uh, go on there, watch my streams or archives or clips that I put on there, and you know uh, I'll let you know when I go live. Which of course probably tweet out the links on Twitter. Of course follow Twitter JP Huffine, see all my stuff, uh, all my takes on you know football, uh, you know closing out the year for the Super Bowl of course, uh, and you know beginning the year in racing now. So you know page turn right into racing after football. So. Uh, you know, be an interesting year of racing and certainly have all the takes there that I don't have on here or use those takes and then fill, you know, flow them into what I say on here, uh, which you'll see on, on my handle at JB Huffine. And, um, uh, I'll put my Instagram out there too, is I'll probably, um, put my pictures or some of the pictures from Rolex 24 there, which you'll probably see, uh, at JB Huffine, uh, go on there and see all my, you know, if I, if I do post Rolex pictures, uh, that's that's where those will be at and maybe on facebook too possibly i don't know yet but i might do that there but follow on there all at jp huffine and of course scripture podcast youtube which will have this on there uh have this on there later in the week probably then the week uh have this uh video on there and you can watch all our shows all everything dating back to march 22 2022 and see uh you know all our episodes since then uh, of course follow know that subscribe to our youtube page subscribe to you know all the pages we have here for this show uh and you know, like our videos comment subscribe you know do whatever you want to interact with the video and all the other stuff so yeah that's it for me this week uh great you know racing at the rolex 24 glad to be back uh there again this year uh glad the acura is one of course own acura tl 2004 so um you know my my make my car one uh and glad to see that so um you know of course glad to be on there with you phil another week and um you know glad to be back and have another year of racing uh to talk about with you here absolutely man uh we were went through it and we went through a lot with the rolex we also got into nascar for the first time this season and uh, we'll have more to come because uh, that'll be going on basically from February to November. Um, thanks as always for everything you do, brother, and for always uh, taking care of your end of the deal and taking care of the video side with the Grifter Podcast uh, YouTube page. For me, you can find me at Phil G. Matthew on Twitter. You can find me at Gripster. Uh, you can find me at Gripster Pod. On Twitter, uh, we have we're on basically anywhere you can hear podcasts. Um, you can also find it at philipgmatthew.com or podbean.com um, to find find the GSP. We will be back next week for episode 155 to review the Bushlight uh, Clash at the Coliseum. We will do a preview uh, and make some picks or maybe not make picks but make a preview uh, of both of the teams in the Super Bowl 
Um, maybe go over the Pro Bowl games. We'll get into the news of motor in motorsports the whole week. Amongst all the major series that we kind of get into in general, there will be a couple of car reveals by before the next episodes. So we'll get into that. Roundup will discuss the Indian Epri and Rally Sweden. So that's what you get to look forward to next next week. We will be back for episode 155. Thank you for supporting us here on the Grift Trip Podcast. Uh, for Josh, I'm Phil. Um, take care of yourself and take care of those around you. Be nice to people. It doesn't take much to be nice. So let's go and try to do that for each other in this time. Uh, take care. God bless and goodbye.